Yes, we are going live in now. We see Claudia. Good morning, everybody. Um, we, welcome to the fifth EFIG plenary of 2021. Thank you so much to the 481 of you who have registered to view this. Um, we will have um, a busy morning with keynotes, uh, introduction to EFIG's work by some of its leading members. And just to walk you through um, the day ahead, um, there are a few slides of housekeeping, which I, as the rapporteur for the EFIG, will walk through. Isabel? Isabel, so, you want to come first of all, could everybody who's not speaking go on mute? Sorry, I can hear some background noise there. Um, we, will have a, we will have two halves of today, which will uh, break for coffee at 10.40. The first half is keynotes and an introduction to the EFIG e working group's work. And the second half will be composed of two panels, one from financial institutions to give an indication of what they're doing in this coming decade on energy efficiency. And then the second panel will be to um, uh, look forward to the next two years of EFIG's work and help uh, you, the audience, uh, uh, engage with EFIG um, members to, to guide our uh, future. But um, without, without further ado, I wanted to uh, introduce well, first of all, how you ask questions. Uh, there should be some slides. I, I don't know if you can see them, um, but uh, there will be a slide coming up which will show you that this, uh, uh, this plenary session is being live cast onto um, YouTube. There are three ways of asking questions. You can put a question into the Zoom chat. You can use Slido, which is a website, sli.do, with a code hashtag EEFIG. Please put your name into Slido if you're asking a question there. Or if you're on social media, you can use the hashtag EFIG. The entire uh, plenary will be uh, transcripted. Well, will be, comments of the plenary will be transcripted onto, e onto the EFIG hashtag on Twitter so that those of you listening on social media can follow along. Thank you, Dusan, for that. So uh, as I said, without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor to our two co-conveners. That's Claudia Canaverri, who is the head of energy efficiency policy and finance at DGN Energy, and Eric Usher, who is the head of the UN Environment Program Finance Initiative. Claudia. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, um, uh, really a very welcome uh, from uh, my side uh, to uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, as a special welcome to uh, uh, our Director General, Mrs. Uh, uh, Dite Yul Jorgensen, to the Vice President uh, of the EIB, uh, uh, Mr. Ostros, uh, um, and to Eric, uh, and all, to all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, clearly it would have been better to uh, meet in person um, and it's uh, with regret that we cannot do that, but we are lucky that uh, the technology allows us to have this uh, uh, plenary meeting. And I'm very pleased to see uh, a large part of the EFIC community uh, present today and that everybody responded so positively to our invitation. Uh, is in fact uh, uh, really good to see that we have uh, more than uh, 460 registration um, for uh, uh, this uh, important uh, meeting and that many of these uh, registrations are from uh, uh, financial institutions. This annual event is the occasion for our members to look back uh, at the achievements that we reached uh, in the course of 2020, but to discuss the results and to look ahead uh, what the, for the plans uh, for the future. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, we have a lot of challenges coming up, so the EFIG contributions uh, will be really very important. And uh, it is quite impressive to see uh, how much uh, uh, has been reached in the course of 2020, despite of uh, the difficult uh, uh, working situations, uh, situation. Uh, Peter has already introduced you to the program. Um, so um, um, just to say that uh, in a moment, uh, uh, I will hand over to Eric Usher from uh, UNFI. And then I'm particularly delighted that after um, it will be uh, our Director General and the EIB Vice President that will give the keynote uh, uh, speakers. It is really important to have uh, uh, two so distinguished uh, uh, guests uh, uh, for the meeting uh, today. 
uh, and then uh, um, we will have uh, um, a discussion on uh, um, um, uh, the consequences uh, of the green recovery on the AFIG work program, and this is particularly important uh, for our work as uh, for our work as you can imagine. Um, and uh, I would like to um, um, give a couple of uh, action points uh, um, uh, to you. One is that I really would like to encourage, especially members of financial institutions, uh, to become an active part uh, of the AFIG working groups uh, or of the AFIG communication team. And the second is that if you are not a member, please uh, visit our website and express you in your interest in joining the group. And last but not least, I would like to uh, very much thank Peter, the consortium and the speakers for making this year's event possible. Uh, and uh, I hope that everybody will enjoy today's uh, uh, meeting and, uh, and tomorrow as well, of course, uh, and that there will be a lot of interesting points uh, for discussion and for uh, further developments of our work. And uh, with that, uh, I would like uh, to hand over the uh, floor to Eric uh, Usher for the second, uh, let's say, short introduction uh, of our uh, plenary meeting. Thank you very much and have a very nice uh, and successful day. Thank you very much, Claudia, and uh, thank you, uh, Peter, and everyone for being together today. Um, <clears throat> this is a, an important year um, for many reasons. Um, um, one is for getting the pandemic uh, uh, fully in hand um, and addressed and for building back from it. Um, it's a year of, of net zero and, and leading towards uh, COP26 in Glasgow. And, you know, I think it's important for the financial community and, and all in the private sector to see that maybe it's a year where we, we finally break the tragedy of horizon. And if you look in the, in the Paris Agreement in 2015, they talk about by end of century. Um, then going back about two years ago, we start talking about, well, if we're going to stabilize well below two down to 1.5, we need to get to zero by mid-century. Um, I think much more importantly for the private sector is um, political commitments and now private sector commitments that are talking about 2030. Um, uh, Europe um, is, is targeting there to reduce uh, significant reductions by 2030. We have the UK 10 point plan. Um, and even more importantly, we're starting to hear about actions being aimed for 2025. Um, Allianz, a, a major global uh, uh, investor recently setting their target for 25% emissions reductions by 2025. Uh, now, these are um, significant um, challenges, um, and uh, I think regulators led by the EU um, and the European Commission um, with its um, action plan and now preparing its second action plan, its green taxonomy, um, it's sending the signals that the private sector need to, to understand. Um, so things are well prepared for a year where we can really help deliver um, make energy efficiency sort of the first engine of growth in driving green growth, green jobs for an economic recovery that uh, builds back from the current crisis but prepares us for the, the, the next global crisis, that of uh, uh, climate change. With that, um, our real pleasure to be continuing to work uh, with the, the Commission and with all of you all in trying to make um, create a, a clear rationale and the avenues in which uh, energy efficiency can really make an economic, environmental, and sustainability difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia and, and Eric. Um, it's really a pleasure to have had your support for so long now. And without further ado, it's a pleasure and a, and a first for the EFIG plenary to welcome uh, Dieter Jul Jürgensen, who is the Director General of DG Energy. Um, she is known for her inclusive approach and she has been working at the Commission for 28 years. Dieter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, and good morning, uh, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to be here, as you said, a first um, at the IFIC. So a warm welcome to everyone to this year's uh, meeting. It takes place in extraordinary circumstances, which by now seem somewhat ordinary to sit and meet uh, many people on, uh, on Zoom. Um, but we have uh, gained experience, and I think we're all committed to making sure that this, uh, this year's event will be a success as well. The COVID pandemic has forced us to work in different ways, to live in different ways, and has impacted everyone around the world. It has put unprecedented pressure on governments in the European Union, but governments globally, really. And, and they now need to deal with the fallout from, from this COVID crisis, the economic fallout, the, the health fallout, the social fallout, while dealing, of course, uh, with the impending climate crisis. 
And, and at the same time, we think that the recovery from this COVID crisis represents an opportunity. It pushes us to accelerate climate neutral economy by 2050, uh, starting with our 55% emission reduction target by 2030 that the previous speaker also refer referred to, and, and which has really become the, the key goal um, of the European uh, Green Deal and the number one priority of the commission of, uh, of President Ursula von der Leyen. Now, in order to achieve our climate targets, it's clear that we do need energy efficiency. It's absolutely vital to achieve the goals. Um, in fact, our long-term strategy and our analysis shows that energy efficiency is the main contributor to decarbonisation by 2050, um, uh, so we need to take action here. One of the first points we are looking at is to make sure that we have the right regulatory framework. Uh, we are looking at revising the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, which really can play an important role in shaping and implementing our energy and climate policy. So the revision of this uh, key directive will strengthen the link with other policies, renewable energy, climate action, to ensure the most effective uh, results. We have launched public consultation on our energy efficiency directive, and the public consultations are closing just today. So we very much look forward to see what are the ideas, what are the comments, what are the suggestions that we hear from a wider public. Um, the Renewable Energy Directive and the Emission Trading Scheme are some of the other pieces of legislation that need to interact with the energy efficiency the regulatory framework uh, in order to reach the best and most cost effective results as regards climate and uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, energy efficiency first is a pillar of our energy efficiency policy, of our energy policy, and we need to make sure, of course, that it applies to all sectors of the economy. We are preparing guidelines in the, in the European Commission for how to make the energy efficiency first principle uh, operational, and we look forward to sharing that uh, with partners later this year. Um, as you will know, uh, the EU has put in place a recovery plan, a recovery and resilience uh, facility called Next Generation EU, which amounts to 750 billion euro and um, that will be challenged through a recovery and resilience uh, facility. Um, we have agreed, European heads of state and government have agreed that 37% of all spending under the re recovery and resilience facility should go to climate related investments. And of course, energy efficiency measures as essential to achieving climate targets are an excellent opportunity uh, for investments in this context, both in terms of their support for the climate targets, but also because investments into energy efficiency and renovation of, house, renovation of housing in particular um, are particularly good at creating jobs and local growth, which is needed uh, for the recovery. The precise needs for investments into renovation and energy efficiency, of course, varies between European member states, but, um, uh, but all member states have or will have long term renovation strategies um, that can help guide uh, investments and plans. What we see is that a decarbonisation of the building sector is absolutely vital to deliver on the 2030 climate target. And buildings represent about 40% of our total energy consumption in the European Union and 36% of energy related greenhouse gas emissions. 75% of our building stock in the European Union is inefficient. And, and a very large share of the current building stock, around 85 to 95% buildings, would still be standing in 2050. So we need to take action to make sure they become more energy efficient. With that in mind, we launched last October a renovation wave that aims to double the building renovation rate across Europe with regulatory means, and I've just referred to one of them, but also very much, of course, with financing and other types of support. Um, it's uh, clear that the renovation of buildings has an advantage both from an energy efficiency and climate perspective, but it does bring a number of other benefits for people. There are better living and working conditions, cleaner air, energy security, lower energy costs, thus helping to address energy poverty. And, and then, as I mentioned, the creation of significant green jobs in the renovation sector, and we need to make sure we have the skills that are needed for that. Now, um, the role of private financing, and therefore of today's, uh, of today's setting, uh, is of course crucial in achieving um, our target. 
public fun financing or public funding cannot do it uh, alone. We need about 150 billion additional per year on energy efficiency in the coming years to achieve our targets. So very significant investments uh, are needed and a strong case for private investment for financing schemes to mobilize private investment and that can benefit from the um, from the catalytic effect of public catalytic effect of, of public spending. So we need project development assistance and financing schemes that combine technical assistance, loans, grants, and they all have great potential in this context. A good example is Elena. One euro spent on Elena leads to about 35 euros in total investments. What we see is that member states can rely on strength and financing for the Elena facility from the Invest EU Advisory Hub and possibly also from other European programs. They can use part of the recovery funds to establish Elena like facilities nationally, and, and that would push faster and more effective rollout of funds for energy efficiency and, and renovation. Um, a second point or another point is the investment climate. It's clear that we need to build a, a favorable environment for investors. Investors need evidence uh, and understanding of the, mar of the fact that energy efficiency is profitable and has all the right tools. As you will know, the EU has adopted an EU taxonomy that can play a significant role in directing private investments, providing information and direct towards sustainable projects. And by creating a common classification system for sustainable economic activities, it will make sustainable finance more transparent and more attractive um, as well. So the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, EFIC today, really holds a key place in activating private sector investments. Through the previous activities, you have already in EFIC provided significant contribution to the better understanding of challenges and opportunities to energy efficiency financing. The development, for example, of Europe's largest database of energy efficiency investment projects, the de-risking energy efficiency platform, or the EFIC underwriting toolkit that assists financial institutions to evaluate the, to evaluate the value and risk of energy efficiency and investments. These tools clearly document already the existence of investment opportunities in the energy efficiency sector. As regards further developments, we in the third phase count on EFIC to both show that making buildings greener is a safe investment for financial institutions, assess if energy efficiency improvements could result in lower probability of default associated loans and an increased value of the underlying assets, to quantify the advantages of building renovation beyond energy and bill savings, we need reliable data, we need data on health benefits and improvements in comfort and quality of life. We would also count on EFIC to provide us with examples of best financing practices and insights on how one can replicate and scale them throughout Europe on the basis of national um, experience. And then to identify the relevant support actions to encourage further energy efficiency in the industry. So I would like to thank EFIC for its valuable contribution to scaling up energy efficiency investments. And I would very much like to encourage you and IFIC to continue working with determination, dedication on ways to improve and promote energy efficiency financing, which is a key component of the European Green Deal, of the EU recovery and resilience package, uh, and of course, the renovation wave. And then I would like also to thank uh, the EIB for the excellent cooperation we have also on these issues. And I look very much forward to hearing about the lead role that the European Investment Bank as the Clim Climate Bank is playing in this in this area and will, I think, continue to play in the climate transition. And with that, we'll pass the floor on to Thomas Ostras, who is Vice President of the European Investment Bank, and wish you all every success in the event today and tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dieter. It matters an enormous amount uh, to us, everything that you say, and we hope that the EFIG group uh, can live up to the, uh, to the high expectations that you and colleagues have of us. Um, without further ado, um, therefore, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Thomas Ostros. Thomas is the Vice President of the EIB Management Committee. Um, he's joining us from Sweden. Prior to joining the EIB, Thomas worked with the IMF. Uh, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a great pleasure for me uh, on behalf of the European Investment Bank, uh, the Bank of the European Union, to participate in the EFIG plenary meeting and to address this crucial topic on the role of energy efficiency in the climate transition and the economic recovery. 
Let me start by stressing the importance of energy efficiency investments to achieve the decarbonization of the EU economy. To meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement, energy systems must be transformed quickly. The EU has adopted a comprehensive legal framework with ambitious climate and energy targets in 2030, and the goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. By setting the example, the EU has encouraged other countries to follow suit. Energy efficiency plays a key role in all decarbonization scenarios. The International Energy Agency has estimated that almost half of the additional CO2 reductions needed can only be achieved through energy efficiency measures. Investing to reduce energy consumption remains the most cost-effective way for the EU to meet its objectives. It increases security of energy supply, improves competitiveness, and reduces carbon intensity. Energy efficiency reduces energy costs for industry, for commerce, and for households while increasing employment. As it is often said, the cheapest, safest, and most secure form of energy is the energy we do not use. Energy efficiency improvements cannot be taken for granted without additional and sustained efforts. The European Commission has estimated an investment gap over the next decade of 185 billion euros per annum in energy efficiency, 115 billions only in the residential sector. The latest progress report just before the COVID-19 hit our lives found both EU final and primary energy consumption levels to be above the 2020 targets. As a result of the COVID-19 crisis, energy efficiency targets can be met. However, this is expected to be a temporary situation because the reduction of energy consumption has not been driven by structural measures. Without targeted climate measures, the economic recovery will bring energy consumption back towards pre-COVID-19 crisis levels. Against the backdrop of slow energy efficiency improvements, the COVID-19 crisis has added a new layer of uncertainty. While the full impact of the COVID-19 crisis may take years to properly understand, the crisis poses both risks and opportunities for global energy efficiency. The building sector is witnessing a partial shift in energy demand from commercial to residential buildings as social distance, distancing and uh, teleworking take hold. However, even when office remain unoccupied, most continue to consume energy for maintenance of heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems or to power computing servers, computer service. Moreover, if increasing ventilation rates are needed to minimize the risk of respiratory infections, the energy used by buildings, heating and cooling systems will also increase. Still, working from home may have net benefits for energy use and emissions, which comes mainly from reduced commuting. It is uncertain if behaviors that may be positive for energy efficiency will persist when the crisis passes. But in the absence of targeted government policies, a return to pre-pandemic behaviors seems to be the most likely scenario. At the EIB, we are truly committed to promote energy efficiency investments. Overall lending to energy efficiency activities has experienced a massive increase over the last years, from 1.5 billion euros in 2012 to 5.8 billion euros in 2020. From being a relatively small part in the overall energy lending, 12% in 2012, energy efficiency is now the largest subsector, absorbing more than 50% of the bank's energy lending last year. In 2019, we decided to drastically increase EIB's level of climate action ambition. And as the EU Climate Bank, we committed to end our financing of unabated fossil fuel energy, to align all financing activities with the goal of the Paris Agreement, to dedicate at least 50% of EIB financing to climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025, and to support 1 trillion euros of climate and environmental investment in this decade. And when updating our energy lending policy in 2019, we put energy efficiency first at the forefront 
or lending activities. In particular, the new energy lending review gives a res response to some of the most acute challenges faced by energy efficiency investments. Let me start with uh, fragmentation. The simplest energy refurbishment of a building consists of a large number of independent sub-projects, replacing boilers, renovating the facade, increasing the insulation of the walls, and so on. Fragmentation can only be addressed by the aggregation of small projects in larger schemes, like the operation we supported in the French Picardy region, with the objection, objective of renovating private apartments to generate 50 to 75% energy savings. One important element of this operation was the use of the ELENA grant budget, in this case, 1.8 million euros, to provide not only financing, but also technical assistance for the implementation of the works. Based on this experience, the EIB will establish an EIBR, a one-stop shop for energy efficiency, to reinforce it, its activities in this field, including technical assistance activities, aggregation, and exploring new forms of financing, such as mortgage-based lending. The EIB is also supporting the EMAP project, the market-led initiative to standardize green mortgages, incentivizing the improvement of the building stock performance. The EIB has already implemented this frame framework in specific operations, such as one in Spain and Portugal with Union de Creditos Immobiliarios, UCI, for the origination of at least 150 million euros of energy efficiency mortgages for the renovation of existing properties and the construction of high efficient ones. Another challenge for energy efficiency investments are the financial and capital constraints. Many commercial banks face uncertainties regarding energy efficiency investments, a new asset class for most of them. Risk sharing instruments have the ability to remove part of the uncertainty, thereby encouraging greater amounts of private sector capital and making energy efficiency investing attractive to a larger number of financial institutions. With this objective in mind, private finance for energy efficiency, PF4E, was developed by a joint agreement between the EIB and the European Commission to address the limited access to adequate and affordable commercial financing for energy efficiency investments. Transparency also key to build up confidence and gather investor support to new asset classes. With this purpose, the EIB has participated in the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy Group. Once approved, the taxonomy will contribute to a consistent approach to the establishment of a common language in green finance. A third challenge for energy efficiency investments is its horizontal role. In contrast to other energy subsectors, energy efficiency investments cut across traditional sectoral boundaries, social housing, SME lending, or transport. Hence, at the EIB, we have increased the number of multi-sectoral operations, combining energy efficiency investment in educational, healthcare, and social housing projects, such as the construction of 525 social housing units in Navarra, Spain, following passive house standard with a 75% reduction against the minimum requirements in the building regulation. Yet another challenge for energy efficiency investment is the technical complexity. Most energy efficiency investments require expert support to be successfully implemented. For this purpose, the EIB increasingly promotes blending the financing with the permission of technical assistance, as in the already mentioned PF4E instrument or the European Local Energy Assistance, ELENA, a joint initiative by the EIB and the European Commission that we highly appreciate. ELENA provides uh, grants for technical assistance focused on the implementation, among others, of energy efficiency projects. Last but not least, a challenge for energy efficiency investment are also the economic barriers. Split incentives between landlords and tenants, or the highly subsidized electricity and heating prices for retail consumers, decreasing the attract attractiveness of energy efficiency investments. There is not much that we as a bank can do in this respect, apart from targeting those countries where the incentives are best aligned, 
But it is necessary to keep in mind that no silver bullet exists to increase energy efficiency investment and that it requ requires the collaboration of many different players. So uh, banks, including ourselves, need to combine strategic direction and the right organizational setup to deliver. Strategic leadership to define specific targets for climate action and energy efficiency lending volumes and the commitment ability of the organization to deliver on these targets. Within the EIB, we have witnessed an increased appetite for scaling up energy efficiency finance. And although admittedly retail and corporate lending present their own challenges, we are observing a common feature. Investing in sustainable project adds value to our corporate brand. This is a brief summary of how we at the EIB have increased energy efficiency lending, scaled up our support in a very short period of time, tailoring our solutions to the specific challenges of energy efficiency, being flexible in the range of instruments that we offered, but inflexible in keeping our unremitted commitment, engaging our organization with clear top-down targets combined with a bottom-up approach to put energy efficiency first. Considering the potential value of investing in efficiency in other sectors. And finally, blending our lending with resources from the European Commission, managing authorities, private investors, and technical assistance. It has sometimes been a bumpy road, but also a highly rewarded one. Our plan is to keep pursuing it in the coming years. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with uh, the EIB's teams in EFIG for the last seven years. I must uh, compliment you and your colleagues for being phenomenal contributors to the EFIG forums. And it's uh, wonderful to hear how seriously you and your institution are focusing on the challenges ahead for increasing energy efficiency investments in finance. Um, I notice uh, we are running very slightly ahead of time. So thank you very much to everybody for your punctuality and um, your, uh, uh, your brevity. Um, so therefore, what I'm going to suggest is we're going to move straight into the first panel. Um, so uh, my panelists, um, if you are able to switch on your cameras, um, that is Elizabeth from BNP Paribas, Carlos from Alliance Investment Management, Karen from the Tixis, um, and uh, Andreas from uh, the Energy Efficiency Industrial Forum. Uh, this panel will be divided into four sections. So uh, those of you, uh, thank you to the 270 plus um, attendees we have now present and those listening through um, uh, YouTube. Um, if you wish to ask questions to this panel, you should write them into the Zoom chat or into Slido using the hashtag eFig key to get in or uh, into social media via Twitter using the hashtag EFIG, E-E-F-I-G. All of these channels are being monitored by our teams and they will be curating the questions that will be, uh, will be put to this panel um, in, in the last section. So uh, uh, without further ado, what I will suggest is each one of my panelists can have two minutes to introduce themselves and their organization and their commitment to EFIG. Then we will hear from each one of them a five minute overview of the activities of the working group, which they are representing. Then we will have a 15 minute panel debate, and then we will have an extensive Q&A session with the audience. So therefore, uh, in the order that you can see on the screen, um, st starting off with Elizabeth, uh, I'd welcome our panelists to provide their introductions, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Migno within BNP Paribas Fortis. I'm responsible for the implementation of all legal mandatory and sustainable topics in the credit departments. On the BNP Paribas group level, I'm the single point of contact for the energy efficient mortgages. Within PNP, uh, when we got the invite to join the EFIC working group, we felt privileged to share an exchange with this great group of members who share best practices, research, experience in order to contribute and to enable a true transition. Energy transition is really important to us. 
Quoting our CEO, Jean-Laurent Bonafé, he says, BNP Paribas as an international bank has its duty to contribute to a better future. Being in the center of the economy, aside taking actions ourselves, we bring the diverse players together to direct the financial capital to projects that address the issue of climate change and more broadly, a sustainable economic development. So this is why back in 2017, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the United Nations Environment Program and, or, and BNP Paribas. UNEPFI and BNP Paribas will scale the collaborative effort by establishing sustainable finance activities, <clears throat> finance facilities in many developing countries with a target funding of $10 billion by 2025. This through sourcing funding and arranging and issuing green loans. The EFIC Working Group is a great idea and demonstrates how organizations are committed to a zero emission target and what we are doing to achieve this commitment together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Carlos, over to you. Thank you, Peter. I hope you can hear me now. There's always a problem with the muting. Great. That's good. So, well, I'm glad to be here with my fellow panelists today and uh, to present a little bit of what we do at Alliance. I work for Alliance France, so it's the, the division in, uh, of, of the German insurance company uh, Alliance in Germany. Uh, Alliance in general holds 2.2 trillion in assets under management in total. And when well, I, I represent Alliance France in this case, so that means we are uh, holding a portfolio of 90 billion uh, euros, which is uh, as an asset owner, as, as the money that is invested from Alliance comes from the insurance side. I am part of the ESG innovation and governance team in France, and this is a team that is in charge of pushing all the agenda regarding sustainability topics. Uh, I am particularly in charge of the integration of the EU taxonomy uh, for the Alliance group in general in everything that concerns investments. So how are we going to make it possible that by the reporting period, by 2022, we're going to be able to report on the share of our portfolio aligned with the taxonomy? That it's uh, quite a challenge to, to do, but it's the project that uh, we are doing at this point. Uh, to remember, as a remember, Alliance, it's also part of the platform sustainable finance uh, that was formed last year. So we're working a lot uh, with the commission and everything that is linked to the taxonomy. I also work on some other projects which are in cap natural capital and biodiversity as we have to assess the risk of biodiversity uh, to our portfolio. So how is every investment that we make, every euro that we make impacting not only the carbon side, but also going further to that to take into account risks such as biodiversity, which is quite a big challenge, not only uh, at French level, but at, at, at world level. I am also involved in, in, in parts of, um, of ESG fund assessments uh, for all the multi-asset classes. We hold portfolios of equity, fixed income, alternatives, and real estate, and involved also in everything that is shareholder engagement. Uh, if I have some little bit of time, it's good to remind that Alliance is part of the Asset Owner Alliance. And this is an alliance that uh, it's pledging for a net zero portfolio by 2050 with several other asset owners. Thank you, Peter. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Um, and now to Karen. Can you, can you see me and hear me? Very well. Perfect. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Karen de Goofs. I'm head of sustainable uh, business development within uh, Natixis. Um, Natixis is a um, is a French uh, multinational financial services firm, which is specialized in uh, asset management, corporate and investment banking, insurance and payments. It's part of a larger uh, French banking retail group called BPC, Banque Populaire Caisse d'Epargne. Um, basically, my role, uh, I'm developing for the group uh, uh, throughout those different businesses, uh, sustainable um, in, uh, uh, business solutions and so for our clients, but I've also um, been involved uh, in a, a over the past three years in a, an in internal initiative called the Green Weighting Factor, which I had presented to the AFID group uh, a little while back now, um, which is basically a mechanism by which uh, we rate 
uh, every single loan that we have in our loan book on the banking side um, for its uh, environmental attributes. So we evaluate the environmental impacts, including climate in particular, but not only, um, of every single loan. And then we adjust uh, internally in an analytical way the capital allocation of those loans to provide an incentive an internal in incentive um, to, uh, to uh, business originators uh, to direct uh, our business activity through uh, to a more green business. Um, I've also been involved in, in other um, uh, uh, specific developments for the bank, including biodiversity, which, uh, which is probably less, uh, less relevant for the work that we are doing for EFIG. Um, and I'm part of the, um, on the, of the working group on risk assessment. That's Brilliant. it for me. That, that, thank you so much, Karen. That was excellent. Well timed. Um, and we turn the floor now to Andreas. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone. My name is Andreas. Uh, I'm the foundation director of the European Industrial Insulation Foundation. Um, we are specialized in training and executing energy audits uh, on insulation systems in the industrial environment and also for technical equipment in the building sector. We did about 2,500 in the past years, and uh, we were one of the yeah, members in the EFIC industry working group to feed the de-risking energy efficiency platform with the broad experience and examples of um, yeah, how energy efficiency can be kind of uh, yeah, established, included in industrial complexities. Uh, we heard Thomas also talking about um, yeah, the technical complexity when it comes to industry. And uh, yeah, we are, we are very happy to contribute to the EFIC industry working group uh, with the knowledge and know-how we have from an ex uh, technical um, side, let's say. And uh, yeah, so please to support the work. Uh, we do see there is a big need uh, for investments in industry to become more energy efficient. And there are different challenges. One is to scale up smaller projects with smaller investments to make it attractive for banks to, to be in. And of course, uh, the complexity and the flexibility of markets is a, is a very special challenge. And of course, we do see that there are larger scale projects uh, which can make, um, you know, like we talk about green hydrogen and other things. And we hope that with our technical expertise, which is quite uh, focused, of course, that we can help to develop and facilitate here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you for keeping to time. I realize those of you watching may not know that the EFIG group is now subdivided into specific working groups. The four speakers that you've just heard are actually coming representing each one of those working groups. Working groups last for two years. They have members ranging between 30 to 60 uh, contributors. Um, from financial institutions and experts. So what we're going to have now is a five-minute uh, presentation of the ongoing work of those working groups. I realize from the slides that you do not have the working group names um, uh, shown. So therefore, as I introduce, uh, reintroduce Elizabeth, I'm going to say Elizabeth's going to talk about the Financial Best Practices Working Group. Elizabeth. You're on mute. Elizabeth, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, we can now. Yes, sorry for that. So uh, we had a very exciting journey last year, apart from the obvious constraints, uh, which obliged us to keep three working group meetings virtual. We had a very fascinating exchange uh, and amazing results, uh, which you see in our interim report of 128 pages. I uh, cannot summarize everything or tell everything what is in the report. I would really invite you to read it uh, uh, to be able to see that, but I'm gonna do my best. So um, when IFIC started five years ago, it demonstrated the importance uh, to the European Commission to work further with financial institutions. And our approach was on different levels. We had a holistic level, a science-based approach, and a more case study uh, approach uh, to the reality. So on the holistic approach, we looked at um, what are the enablers and barriers to do these energy efficiency investments. 
Enablers being, of course, a clear business case, technical assistance, fiscal support, transaction costs, and barriers would be the lack of knowledge of energy saving potential, technical risk, repayment capacity, et cetera. When we then go down to the more science-based level, uh, we created a knowledge sharing platform with over 650 reference documents on 18 instruments and practices, which you see listed on the slides. Uh, we had five teams in our work group um, that were organized to advance knowledge across working groups on various teams. So we had one team, the first team, uh, working on the implementation of the past EFIC recommendations. So they looked at monitoring, presenting data on the state of implementation of the previous EFIC recommendations. So this was including uh, market actions, economic actions, financial actions, institutional actions, and would be, for example, on the improvement of the certification of EPC standards, uh, improvement of information flows, uh, the databases, uh, economic actions, looking at uh, optimizing the use of European structural and investment funds. Then they looked at financial actions, um, development of common set of procedures and standards for energy efficiency in buildings, uh, adjustment to the financial regulatory frameworks to better support uh, capital market innovation, etc. Then uh, there was a second team, I was part of that team, uh, looking at the evolution of financing practices in buildings. So what we did is we assessed the main trends, for example, availability of tailored energy efficiency debt products, uh, reviewed the main barriers and drivers for investing into energy efficiency in buildings, and explored the development of a secondary market, including the involvement of institutional investors. Barriers we saw is a long payback, low energy prices, um, and as drivers, we more uh, uh, saw incentives and policy, etc. Then there was a third team uh, looking at the evolution of the financing practices in the industry. They analyzed current trends and challenges, uh, looked at how recommendations from energy audits could turn into an action. Uh, plan and recommendations on how to help SMEs to invest. Team four looked at the refinancing and development of secondary markets focused on the monitoring and collecting of data, gather intelligence uh, to analyze the evolution of financing practices for energy efficiency refinance, for example, the post-pandemic packages, which were also mentioned this morning, they often pushed for a relocation uh, of strategic goods in the EU and often associated with energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction requirements. The national uh, energy efficiency flame frameworks, um, we have the EU clean energy package, which has a target for energy savings for 2030. They rolled out through the national uh, environments regulations, et cetera. Then we had the fifth team, last team, that looked at the recommendations of the HLAC, the high level expert group on sustainable finance. They assessed how these uh, recommendations related to energy efficiency, could be operationalized. So they looked at barriers to be removed, the drivers to be strengthened, uh, how to improve the environmental exposure of financial institutions. Um, so all these teams, they worked really hard and showed tremendous progress. Last but not least, and I think this is a really important point, which was also uh, mentioned by uh, Dieter Jorgensen, is um, that we looked at the reality and case studies. So we had um, a look at what was really useful, what happened in practice, what worked, what didn't work, uh, where were the main successes, what are the challenges. And I think of an example of the one-stop shop in Ireland, apartment buildings renovation funds in Lithuania, et cetera. So I would say uh, we have a very, very rich and, um, and guidelines. So would invite all of you to, uh, to have a look at it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, so Carlos, why don't you tell us about the working group on multiple benefits? 
Yes, thank you, Peter. So this second working group, as, as, you may, as you may read immediately, is about the multiple benefits of energy efficiency. In there, uh, we're between 15 and 20 people. Sadly, we were not able to meet all the time as we did in the, in the first uh, meeting that took place in, in Brussels. And due to COVID, we had to switch to a different Zoom meeting base. But just to spare details, we'll go directly into, into what the report was. There was a very good contribution between the members. We had uh, like participants from Societe Generale, from FIDE, COI, CBRE, and, and, EB, and EBRD also involved in there. We had some presentations from experts from the Oxford University, from DWS, and the Sustainable Authority of Ireland, so that we could see a little bit what were the challenges to, to put more the attention on everything that it's linked to the multiple benefits. And the good part of all this is that there are tangible results. A 10 uh, pages uh, report was made uh, more on, on a call for action and also uh, showing what are the needs and where are the points where awareness needs to be raised more in terms of multiple benefits. So this report, it's about, it's called Investing for Health. So it's the non-energy benefit of renovations of, of the building sector. As, as we know, we are always focused on on the environmental side, it is it is incredibly important, and we commit to everything that is linked to to the environmental side. But sometimes we disregard everything that is on the social side. And this report is trying to make is just to show public authorities and financial institutions and different other corporations that there are good benefits that can be cited from um, from investing in renewable energies, and this could be on, on the improvement of health. Uh, you could, when, when this report will be released, which will be shortly, uh, you will be able to, to have some key information on, on what is the need for this uh, health improvements. Uh, this is very well backed up with, with different sources on, on the conditions uh, at, at European level. We can see that uh, surprisingly more than 90% of the time that we spend, it's passed indoors. And the fact that we are uh, spending time in this building can have some health impacts that are, that can be for example a lot 2.2 people uh, million europeans are suffering of asthma and in most cases asthma is linked to conditions of living in in, in unhealthy conditions we could also um we could also see that during COVID, a lot of people were lacking light within their buildings, and this is causing also psychological problems and, and mental issues, which will in turn become a public health issue, which will have a cost for society. And as we're paying, as we're paying taxes, then this will be seen in other places. So if we focus on energy efficiency, we could uh, sort out all these long-term problems Problem being that these are investments need to be made right now. We're, we have a time inconsistency problem in, in, in this sense. But uh, one of the key points that can be shown uh, in this report, and, and, and it's that if we invest uh, three euros uh, right now, if all the investments for, for energy efficiency are made right now, which is approximately 325 billion annually, then we could we could make this savings in health in a long in the long term. So for every three euros invested, two of them will be recovered from, from just savings that will be linked to, to health uh, issues. So this is something that it's key uh, when, when we look at the numbers. Problem being that we need to find the incentives to make also financial institutions and the public sector to make these partnerships uh, to focus more on on making this uh, this possible, there's also a data problem, and we we need to we need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to monetize how these benefits are achieved, because in 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 most cases we can see when when we when we're in in the process of decarbonization, if we improve uh, a building in terms of energy efficiency from one EPC level to to another. We can see how much, some, how many CO2 emissions were avoided by this process. What we cannot see is how many people were being benefited by this. How many cases of asthma were reduced? How many, how many people just uh, uh, avoided having uh, mental issues and, and, and health problems? So this it's uh, a key in this sense uh, to just focus on on everything. So if when you read this report, you will be able to 
find a call for action for financial institutions, for public authorities. Also, you will see that there's a lot of awareness that is needed in terms of homeowners, because homeowners need to also uh, realize, um, I mean, that sometimes the intention of a homeowner is just to have access to housing, but sometimes this housing will need in, in the future uh, some, some improvements. So it is, I just, not to take more of your time and just to uh, leave you, uh, read, the, read the report very, very soon. Uh, it will be out uh, coming from this working group has been an excellent work. So just, I invite you just to go through this report. I come back to you just to respect the five minutes, Peter. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. And thank you for being so uh, uh, brief. Um, next up, we have Karen. And Karen's going to talk about our working group on asset level energy performance correlations. Karen. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me cor correctly? Yeah, sorry for checking all the time, but uh, Zoom is, is complicated for, for, for us. Um, so I'm going to try to give you a, very, a brief overview of what's been happening in the working group on risk assessment. Um, maybe just a quick word on the group itself. Uh, there's more than 60 participants and observers in the group. Uh, we're organized through seven national hubs and one method subgroup. Uh, that has been uh, looking at uh, in uh, in-depth uh, case studies and a lot of existing documentation. Uh, the second interim report of this group was finalized in December last year, and the final report is due in October um, this year. Um, there are very active members in the group, so I thought it would be a, a good opportunity to thank everybody for their contribution and very active contribution to all the participants. Um, because I mean, we all do that, uh, you know, in addition to our day-to-day -day work. So I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to do so. Um, basically what that group does is that it, um, it brings together banks and um, research networks, um, looking at the statistical analysis of the re relationship between the credit quality of unsecured loans, mortgage portfolios, and the energy performance of the underlying, uh, underlying buildings being financed. Um, basically, the banks in that group uh, collectively share the view that green lending is not just vital for environmental sustainability, but it, it also makes good economic sense in terms of risk management. However, the statistical evidence required to test this hypothesis is still really emerging. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be put into, into proving that, that this hypothesis is actually true. So banks, banks have been contributed to, contributing to the working group, providing access to their loan books um, and to merge that loan book information with the relevant environmental data points. Um, to undertake analysis of potential relationships. Um, I can give you, I can talk about the example of, of Notixis because we're contributing uh, uh, together with uh, GCD, so global credit data, uh, in uh, sharing our real estate loan book, which is uh, a, approximately 80% rated through our green weighting factor methodology, which is using energy consumption information of each of the underlying assets. So that's the type of, uh, of work that is uh, ongoing in the group. Um, so what are we trying to achieve? We're basically trying to answer to the key question, which can probably be summarized uh, by are green loans less risky? So establishing a correlation between energy efficiency and asset value, and then between asset value and credit risk. Uh, and if we do so, um, we believe it could provide an important case for uh, basically all lenders, but also supervisors uh, to consider energy efficiency of assets in the capital requirements for credit risk. Um, so we're basically what the group aim is, is to provide a new piece of evidence of that uh, correlation. Obviously, through the work that we are doing, um, we're facing a lot of challenges uh, relating to data availability and reliability across Europe, and that's true across the seven uh, geographical hubs, so across different countries. 
Um, solid evidence requires statistical analysis of data. The data is being held by different providers and in many, many cases, not directly accessible. Uh, this I can share with our personal experience uh, throughout uh, the exercise that we have been doing uh, to rate our own um, real estate loan book. Uh, we have collected data, as I said, sorry, <coughs> As I said, uh, for 80% of our loan book, and that's line by line, every uh, asset by every asset, and it's been a real challenge. Uh, basically, there are four types of data that need to be collected, asset level, financial data, which is usually confidential, it sits within the banks, um, a data at the asset owner level, which is also most of the time confidential, um, what we call external normalizing data, which is basically the economic and market environment for the, the assets, and then asset level energy performance data, which is not uh, confidential, which should not be confidential, uh, which should be available throughout uh, uh, Europe, but which uh, proves to be very uh, difficult because not publicly available and in the same way across countries. So for, for that data, uh, a lot of proxy models have been used, but they're not perfect uh, and there are still, uh, uh, they, they, they still lack uh, reliability. Uh, maybe to, to summarize, we have been, the group has been uh, uh, looking at several recent studies, uh, I can't remember how many pages that uh, that covers, but a lot of studies have been done over the recent years uh, by the GRC, uh, EDAB, the Bank of England. Um, several studies uh, were were looked at last year. We constituted a library of academic and research papers that actually show there is a correlation between credit risk, property value and energy performance. So we're confident to have the, uh, through the working group that we have reviewed most of the work that already exists. And maybe as a conclusion and to open up the conversation, I would say the next step is once we prove that there is actually a correlation, what are we going to do and to make up, uh, make out of these results? Um, will there be potential implications for regulatory capital requirements? What kind of incentives can we put in place? And I'm happy to share the Natixis experience uh, through the, the, the green weighting factor, which is basically uh, linking the, uh, uh, putting in, 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 um, in action those correlations, but only in an analytical way until, you know, there's, actual regulatory capital requirements change. Thank you so much, Karen. I really appreciate- I hope I'm in the five minutes. <laughs> yes, I really appreciate. It's such a struggle to uh, to summarize so much in so little time. I appreciate your, uh, your valiant effort. So Andreas, tell us about energy efficiency in industry. Yeah, I think uh, with this working group, we most likely have the most diversified uh, yeah, people attending. So from last meeting was last Friday, uh, was our third meeting. And uh, we had more than 40 participants and um, from financial institutes, from ESCOs, uh, technical experts, but also from universities, researchers. And uh, we had a very lively exchange. The, the chat function during the, the yeah, interventions uh, was gluing because there was so much input. And uh, we are working um, currently on a document called Energy Intensive Industries Partnerships for Deep Decarbonization and Sustained Competitiveness. It's a short issue paper, uh, which gives um, hopefully an idea on, on let's say, the, the, the large energy consumers and what can be done with energy efficiency there. Um, we will also work on one uh, for SMEs, at least this is planned, and non-energy intensive industries, because of course also there uh, we see a, a large potential. In principle, we can say that we have this working group industry um, emphasizes a bit more the importance um, of the whole, let's say, idea to, to implement energy efficiency as a principle. Uh, when we look at EFIC and, and the starting of it, we did some contribution to the 2015 report and uh, the workshop on industry in 2017. Uh, but now this is really leveled up uh, into the own uh, industry working group. And as I said before, of course, we hope that the short issues papers will then also lead to a result. The big challenges, as I said already in, in, in my introduction, uh, when it comes to industry, and this is maybe also why we have so many different experts in this group, 
is that uh, the industrial situation, of course, is very complex. Thomas also said it from EIB. And uh, it's not so easy when you have a large scale project with a long investment uh, payback periods, which are far beyond uh, what a corporate um, company would accept. But of course, what uh, most likely will be needed if we want to achieve uh, to be carbon neutral in 2050, that different experts from different um, angles uh, yeah, sit together. This is what we do and try to find uh, solutions how an investment in energy efficiency in industry can become uh, a success story. Let, let's put it very simple uh, this way. There are, of course, like energy audits or, or others, uh, measures where we know already monitoring is a big thing, um, where we know that they deliver a success, but this won't be enough. And um, as it was said before, and of course we all know that energy efficiency, if it's well done, has multiple benefits, increases competitiveness, reduces production cost. But the biggest challenge for production is always to keep the product at the level of quality it should have at the end. To give you a small example from our experience, um, we audited uh, a plant which is producing the little bottles uh, where the COVID vaccination comes in. And we uh, saw big potential increasing the efficiency of the ovens used to melt the glass and then make it stable small bottles. And the biggest challenge there is that the temperature curve for the glass to cool down has to be in an exact um, range of temperatures dropping to keep the structure of the glass stable for all times so that we don't have one million vaccinations and then the glass breaks. That would be a catastrophe. So that shows a little bit the challenge that there is so much technical complexity and there have to be so many different stakeholders and people involved to see if a project can be of success um, or not. But it also shows, of course, the need for uh, interesting financial uh, yeah, models that you can imagine if you, if you need to invest in, uh, in a new production um, a way of, of new production, maybe new furnaces, new ovens, or whatever kind of example, a new generator, whatever you, you want to look at. Uh, look at green hydrogen and how this can play a role in the future. Um, there's so much to do, but there is so big potential. And I think we all know uh, it won't work without industry. We can't just focus on buildings, uh, agriculture, and transport. Um, and we have to take the European industry with it, and we have to keep it competitive. And I think that is the big challenge, and that is where EFIC uh, Working Group on Energy Efficiency in Industry needs to find uh, yeah, recommendations, solutions, develop ideas, and um, I think we are on track with this exchange. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas. That's brilliant. I uh, appreciate, the com again, the complexity of industry, um, as you've highly outlined. Um, so we're now going to move into a debate. So this is going to be uh, an interesting uh, trial of how we can uh, use Zoom to great effect. So um, both there have been questions coming in from uh, all three of our um, of our mechanisms, and I thank like to thank colleague Dusan for curating them. But uh, perhaps to kickstart um, this part of the the session, um, I'd like to um, ask the 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 panelists, perhaps in order, if you can quick fire in just one minute, tell tell me. How have financial institutions particularly changed in the way that they view energy efficiency since we published our first EFIG report in 2015? And perhaps we can just go in order, starting with Elizabeth. Yes. Hello. I think uh, I am muted at this time. You're good. I hope so. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Good to go. So, um, over six years since uh, the beginning of EFIC, uh, the focus has moved a lot to clear commitments, as I mentioned uh, before, clear policies, as in which uh, industry do we stop financing, which do we stimulate, uh, for example, uh, talking about hydrogen uh, as an example, which industry do we help in the transition, uh, for example, the car industry, we have clear targets uh, to move to electrical cars. Uh, so, but we don't only talk about big projects. Um, we also look at the retail customer. Uh, the retail customer is important and he needs to be uh, accompanied. 
uh, we joined as the first bank in Belgium, uh, the Energy Efficient Mortgage Label, which is really a clear commitment towards guiding our customer to a greener house. And uh, um, I believe that financial institutions are now much more aware uh, than before, than six years ago, and really want to move towards this uh, energy transition. Thanks. Uh, Carlos, do you want to talk about how asset managers and investment managers have changed in the last five years? Yeah, well, in uh, one minute, that will be a little bit hard, but I will do yes, my best. Then, uh, there's two things that should be highlighted in this case, on the, size of, uh, on the case of, of Alliance, for example, we joined the Asset Owner Alliance, so 2050 carbon neutrality. That would mean not only uh, changing in terms of asset allocation, that would also mean that energy efficiency will need to play a key role because uh, divesting is not our, our first option. We accompany companies into improving how they do things. So if we have to address all the different asset classes, we will also have to accompany uh, our infrastructure uh, teams so that they will help, uh, help their investee companies to reduce the, the, the CO2 emissions within the, within, the, within the portfolio so that we can achieve this 20 50 goal. It's one of the big things. Other uh, thing that changed a lot is that the green bonds market has boomed since 2015. And it's now a market that cumulatively would make one, it make one trillion dollars uh, by, by 2020. And in 2050, we we're only talking about 50 billion. In terms of green bonds, well, the second most uh, invested projects through green bonds are buildings. And when we talk about buildings, in most cases, we talk about energy efficiency. So now we have a better way of tracking where it's the money invested going when we increase our green bond spending. Thank you, Peter. Thanks so much. Uh, Karen, I don't know if you can hear us, but uh, do you have a comment on the last five years? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, sorry, I've removed my background because I was told it was upside down. You should have told me. <laughs> sorry, I didn't see it, but yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I definitely think, think that financial institutions have, uh, have evolved a, a lot uh, over the five, 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 five years. I mean, especially since the, the Paris Agreement on, you know, on, on, on addressing climate change issues uh, altogether, but on energy efficiency in particular. Uh, and if I take the example of my own institution, I mean, we, we took a, a, a commitment five years ago to align our uh, loan book with the objective of the, the Paris Agreement. And this is largely uh, gonna be done through, uh, uh, I mean, energy efficiency um, uh, actions and financing energy efficiency, um, not only, but that's part of the, the equation. And I mean, the, the, um, um, the tool that, that we have put in place internally, which is very granular to evaluate the transition potential of each of our clients and each of the assets that we actually finance is really part of that strategy. Um, and, and, and the effects of, of that tool are evolving over the years and they're getting, we're basically banks, in my view, and it's not only my institution, are transitioning from um, exclusion policies where you know we would exclude coal and uh, the most, uh, um, um, controversial uh, oil and gas uh, activities, for example, to actually a very a more granular way of evaluating the transition potential of what we do and what we finance. And that's really, that's really the conclusion of that. I mean, the example of, uh, uh, again, of that methodology that we have developed internally is really driven to that, not going from exclusion to a more granular approach of uh, uh, the transition potential and, and energy efficiency is clearly part of that. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I, I heard that the move uh, away from exclusion also being echoed by Carlos earlier. Andreas, I'm going to switch the attention for you because you're not a financial institution. So I, I'm going to suggest that you might comment on. Um, so you heard from Dita in her keynote that the regulatory framework is being updated quite quickly to reflect um, the need to put energy efficiency first and the greater EU ambition for 2030. How do you see your working group playing into that? Yeah, I think uh, you know this is this is of course one of the um, one of the tasks of the reports, the issue papers, which we do. 
to see how for a higher ambition and um, really getting energy efficiency as a as a first fuel or as the first step to do into uh, really industri industrial reality. Uh, we do see today that this is not happening yet, but what we do see is uh, if I if I may remind that we had an action um, uh, in yeah before uh, the decision that uh, the EU Commission proposed the 55 percent the EU Council then endorsed 55 percent CO2 reductions where 200 CEOs signed a letter to go for this higher ambition. So what we can see is that there is more awareness uh, and there is a willingness in industry to do more. And I think with this working group, we really have to deliver some pragmatic uh, advice how this can be financed. I think this is the job we have and that would be my answer to you. Thanks, Andreas. Yep, you set yourself a high bar, which I enjoy. Um, Elizabeth, um, from the financial institutions or from the bank's perspective, which type, which which parts of the regulatory framework, which Ditta alluded to, are you most focused on, and how do you think that will, um, you know, guide the work of the working group? What we are really uh, looking on is looking at is really um, have some more uh, quantitative analysis uh, through survey interviews. Um, we would also uh, look at our findings and we know that we drastically need to change uh, uh, and really accelerate the pace of investments. So um, looking at a wide variety of business models, tools to enable this and to give, uh, to give financial support to the market segments that are affected um, by by the, the set of market barriers, uh, supporting, incentivizing the mechanisms that uh, will help to uh, to target and consolidate sectors within the market. Uh, so yeah, I think that's uh, Thanks. something I, we're looking at. Yeah, you, you you did mention barriers. I wanted to bring in a question that we had received um, through the chat, which is to you actually. Um, and someone had just yeah. asked, what do you see the biggest barrier of, as being? So it was asked to be MP Paribas. So I thought um, you might be able to, is there one barrier that for you is bigger than any other? Um, I, I really think that many people look at the business case, be it uh, mm -hmm. companies or individuals. Um, it, it has a long, and I saw a comment also in the uh, in the, the comment section. It often investments are long pay, payback period, and uh, sometimes for companies they really have to start focusing on a technology which is not yet uh, proven or which is still under development. Uh, so they have to dare to to do this. And then if you look at uh, individual customers, what we see uh, is that. There's one, one part which is awareness. Uh, people think that they do not really impact the environment that much, but they actually do. Um, and uh, there's no incentive to change it. Um, so yeah, I think when the incentives are created, when prices are going to rise, then of course the business cases are going to change. But I think, I really believe uh, it all comes down to the business case. Thank you. Uh, moving to Carlos. Um, Carlos, you, you mentioned the Asset Ma uh, 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 Managers Alliance previously. I mean, clearly you're looking at the regulatory framework too. So from your perspective, how do you see, uh, well, what do you see the most important regulatory changes that need to take place before 2030? Yeah. So I think, well, what, the problem sometimes comes when, when people do not know what to do uh, in order to make this this uh, multiple benefits occur. So uh, in, in the report is also mentioned that their one-stop shops could be a good solution so that uh, a financial institution could have access to, to, to a, a business opportunity, but at the same time that people would be aware of what can they do and they could just reach one single website. They will be informed of what are the improvements that their house can be done, that they could a schedule like an audit for their house, like an, like, a, like an energy efficiency audit that is also combined in this same one-stop shop and that they could be held by an specialist or, or have access to different companies that are making this. And also what are the helps that the state can provide to them according to the different 
different necessities that the house may need uh, uh, or a residential building in order to be improved. And that way that could create more opportunities for green mortgages and, and also for the financing of, of residential buildings that could enter within a green portfolio, which is the goal of any uh, asset owner or asset manager at this point. Thanks very much. And Karen, you mentioned the targeting of some of the regulatory authorities for the work of the um, Correlations Working Group. Perhaps you could talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, on the regulatory um, side, there's a lot of things happening in Europe at the moment. Uh, that will definitely change, um, you know, to trigger additional change for, for financial institutions. I mean, I'm thinking of the, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which is uh, actually coming into force in less than five weeks now. Um, the EU taxonomy, obviously, uh, that will uh, trigger a lot of change as well. And eventually the prudential regulation uh, that might come after that uh, once, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, hopefully contributed through the risk assessment working group in showing that there is a, 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 a clear uh, link and a clear correlation uh, between the, the, uh, the energy efficiency of assets and the uh, and, and their risk uh, attributes. So yeah, definitely um, a prudential regulation, uh, I think is, uh, it, it, the question is not, will it be happening, is, is when will it be happening? And, and there's probably a, a good case for accelerating that uh, uh, regulation at EU level um, uh, for, for, for banks to, to, to move on. Um, I, I also wanted to mention that the, you know, maybe going back to the data issue, because that's probably one of the clear um, issue that we that we have on the banking side is, is again, collecting data, having reliable data. I know it's been said and said over and over again, but it can, you know, until we have, um, you know, uh, until this policy action, basically, to improve the data availability across Europe, um, it will it will be um, a difficult for for financial institutions without having proper data uh, access to proper and reliable data to actually uh, do the appropriate thing. Um, so we need a centralized, freely available, open source repository of uh, of the energy of, uh, uh, efficiency uh, in, of buildings in particular. I can, I can only uh, emphasize that again and again. <laughs> yes, no, thanks. And, and we had a question actually coming in that talked about um, energy performance certificates and um, whether there are national databases for those, what qualities they are, whether, that, whether using them uh, to, to, to make uh, comparable ambition levels across the EU um, is going to be helpful. I mean, perhaps now we can just bring that in, Karen. Um, do you use in, uh, in the TIXIS the um, energy performance certificates and what's, what, what issues do you see with them? Um, no, TIXIS is a wholesale bank. So the activities that we have on our line book are, will be, uh, um, uh, we don't have mortgages basically, so we don't do retail, but we still, we, use, we, we will use DPC in some cases, but because we have, uh, our loan book is quite uh, small. I mean, we finance very large uh, buildings basically. So we don't, we don't have millions of mortgages in our loan book because we're a wholesale bank. So it's probably easier for us to actually collect individual um, energy performance data on each of the building that we finance. I mean, to give you an idea, we probably have something like five or 600 lines in our loan books. So it makes it much easier than if you have millions of, of mortgages. Uh, but still, the, the quality of the EPCs is, is very different across uh, uh, countries. Um, and the, and the, the, the access to the EPC information is very different across countries. I mean, uh, in, in the UK, it's, uh, it's probably one of the places where it's the most freely accessible. Um, we know that in the Netherlands, uh, the DPCs are also accessible, but uh, I, 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 um, um, we got some feedback from Dutch banks that uh, the, actually more than 50% of the data was not that relevant. Um, in France, it's not freely accessible, so we don't get the EPCs. Uh, we don't, there's a, a, an attempt to, to build that repository at, uh, at, the, at the national level, but it's not yet there. So it's very different from one country to the other. Um, and that's 
basically what I mean when I say we need an open source repository. Uh, 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 you know, the EPC is a good starting point. It's probably not sufficient, but it's probably a good starting point. So we should start with uh, at least uh, collecting all the EPCs across different countries at EU level. That would be a good starting point. Yeah, that's great. And Elizabeth, I know you wanted to come in here. I saw your hand. So perhaps you'd yeah. like to talk about that. Well, as a, as a retail, as the largest retail, retail bank in Belgium, we do have a lot of mortgages on our books. And uh, I confirm that it is really, really a struggle for banks Thanks, to get Murray, this. I'm in the ESG research team working. Oh, that, uh, Murray, Murray you're all, you, you need to I'm mute sorry. yourself. We can hear you. Murray, we can hear you. Please mute. Well. All right. So um, it is a struggle to get this. Uh, the situation in Belgium is that we have three regions with their own EPC uh, database on EPC scoring. So they're not comparable. Uh, we are working hard. So I'm leading the uh, Commission of Economic Affairs that looks at the uh, the uh, the needs for the financial sector in Belgium. Uh, we're working very hard with uh, politics to get this done, but then there's this GDPR issues. And it is uh, it is a real real uh, difficulty to, to get hold on this data. And I know from my colleagues in France, it's the same as as uh, as, as mentioned. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have something, but it's an EPC by default, so it's not very valuable. Um, but uh, there is really a need for a European approach here because uh, on the national level, we are. Um, not strong enough to, uh, to, to push this through. And if you want to, to work with correct data, uh, especially data quality is, is there. If you want to give awareness to our customers, we need to have this data ready, readily available. You're not going to refuse somebody for a, a mortgage a loan a meeting uh, because they forgot to bring the EPC. So we, we should have this, this, uh, this data readily available. Thanks. No, I, I hear that loud and clear. So it's definitely a call um, to improve the visibility, the contents and the hom homogeneity of the uh, energy performance certificates. Excellent. Uh, Andreas, I want to come back to you because um, I know industry has a different way of looking at the regulatory uh, framework. Do you want to make some comments as to how the industry working group would see uh, the most important regulation moving forwards? Well, to be very honest, as we are very diversified, I think uh, it's not up to me just to say, OK, this is what the, the working group industry, um, I think we will have a discussion on this. Um, of course, what we what we discussed in the last meeting, and uh, of course, we've heard it also in, from other panel speakers today, uh, there is a big hope in the into the EU taxonomy. That, of course, plays a very important role uh, in, in, in the future investments in sustainable green projects, of course, if that can be classified. We were talking about standardization as a very important driver. Um, of course, the energy efficiency directive um, and, and um, as, a, as a tool. So let's say there's, there's a lot. Um, we know the CO2 price um, in, in mem many member states, CO2 taxes, but also the, the ETS and CO2 certificates are increasing. So there's a portfolio of many, let's say, regulatory uh, actions which are updated now and the Fit for 55 package. Of course, we are looking closely uh, at this one, but it's a little bit of a bunch of flowers and like the complexity and diversity in industries, I think you can't just say one. In principle, it is very clear that um, energy efficiency first uh, is a very important principle, which we don't see yet happening in industry. That's that's for sure. And uh, I think we all agree that we have to work on this. We do uh, see a lot of potential in the EU taxonomy to make it more clear and classified uh, what, what should be done. And I think that's that's maybe the best summary I can give you from the from the different opinions we have in the working group or different options, maybe Thank not you. even opinions, but options. Thanks very much. Um, so Linda raised a uh, question in the chat, which is, how do I get my hands on all these reports that have been referred to? Um, so <clears throat> all of the working groups, of course. So, for, so first of all, um, EFIG uh, is producing, as time goes by, short issue papers. Issue papers are being made available through the EFIG newsletter. The EFIG newsletter is something you can subscribe to by visiting DGNA's website 
and the website address I put into the chat, which is where you will find eFig's website. So if you subscribe to the eFig um, newsletter, you will be informed of all of the reports and all of the issue papers which are coming out from these working groups. And this year is a big year for the working groups. All of them have been working for, or will have been working by around October, no November time for two years and they have to produce their final report, which will be public. So perhaps um, I can sort of turn to the panel again um, and uh, starting off with, you know, Elizabeth, um, is there anything, you know, just really sort of really quickly sort of bullet fashion, is there anything coming up uh, this year that you think is important for the um, for your working group and, and uh, how will we get the message out about your activity? Yeah, well, what we are going to do is we are going to look at the uh, previous report. We're going to update it. Um, we're really looking at to get some more uh, response from active players. Uh, so to get a, a, broader, um, a broader response rate, uh, looking at, uh, at all possibilities uh, for financing, uh, um, for example, fiscal benefits, etc. Uh, how how we can really stimulate um, the the investment in energy efficiency? Thank you, uh, Carlos. A couple of questions have come up in the chat for multiple benefits. Um, Stephen Forks have talked about how we need to move away from just just energy savings, um, and we had another question uh, relating to um, how we how we measure the the multiple benefits. I think this is an area that's attracted a lot of attention, uh, both sort of now and for the last years. How will you, as the working group, sort of uh, put forward uh, new proposals as to qu the quantification of those? Yeah. So one of the things that could be quantified more is. As I mentioned before, there are, when we talk about social benefits, these are social benefits that sometimes are just spread around society. So if you build a good building or an efficient building in, in a neighborhood, and then this is spread around this same neighborhood, it has a spillover effect over building creations. There's also uh, ideas on, on increasing the amount of KPIs that we can monitor. For this, we will need, of course, uh, there's one problem such as air quality inside buildings, and there's also uh, gases like radon that is created in, inside. So if we are able to monitor air quality within uh, buildings, we could also see how much people were less exposed to this type of, uh, of, of, uh, of bad air quality and particulate matter that may generate within buildings, which, are, which do not have the right ventilation. And then with this, we could actually take into account which are the benefits for society and by tracking these KPIs, we can give a further value to, to this. And, and I would like to echo that the, the social taxonomy, it's also under discussion at EU level. And then this could be the types of KPIs and projects that could be valued by this. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Karen, you've mentioned it a few times that there is, there is a very, it seems to me, immediate regulatory um, uh, series of, of changes coming up for financial institutions. The correlations between asset level energy performance and energy efficiency is is what we've often referred to in the working group as being the sort of um, the golden chalice of 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 the proof factor. Sort of. So, how do you think, um, based on your observations of how the different banks of the working group are coming forward with that evidence now, how do you think we'll be able to uh, document that and get it into the public sphere this year? Well, that's a, I mean, based on the, the recent studies and a lot of the studies that we have, a lot of the, uh, the research that we have collected uh, uh, through the working group um, and the work that is being, uh, um, that is ongoing uh, with the contribution of all the banks in the group, um, there's clearly emerging, it's more than emerging evidence um, of the, uh, the role of energy efficiency in reducing the default probability of the borrowers. Uh, and that's true for, at the mortgage level and it's true for wholesale uh, uh, loans as well. Um, so and that was a bit of my question in the introduction is what, what do we do with that? <laughs> um, clearly, you know, uh, we believe that if we want to provide a strong incentive for the banks to actually finance in energy efficiency, which is well needed across buildings in Europe, um, we need some sort of incentive on the, at the prudential level. Um, so what I'm referring to is, is, is regularly called the, 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 the green supporting factor. But then the, 
the, the flip of the coin is that, you know, if you do agree that, you know, green buildings are less risky, you might, uh, you might also believe that brown buildings might also be a little bit risky than they are, um, than, that, that they are, that, you know, then they are evaluated today. So there's lo uh, still a lot of work ahead of us in, you know, confirming that evidence of the link between the energy efficiency of buildings and the actual um, PDs sides of the coin. Because what we have started to look at in our in our own loan book is that the. Uh, uh, the brownness, if you want, of the of the uh, of, of the uh, uh, real estate uh, buildings that we have in our land book, uh, the risk is already well evaluated. Um, so, I mean, some of the some of the work that we have already done, and that's still preliminary, and that still needs to be confirmed over time, shows that risks are well evaluated for buildings that are not energy efficient. But for buildings that are energy efficient. Less risky the building is not so. This is probably the work that we still have ahead of us in the few months that we have uh, left until the, the final report. Um, but uh, as I said, there's a you know there's a there's clearly an emerging evidence, and that needs to be uh, basically confirmed uh, through the, the work that we are still uh, still doing, and 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 causality needs to be explored uh, uh, still a little bit further. Thank you. We, we have <clears throat> great expectations this year for the for that report that you referred to. Um, now, finally, Andreas, if I may uh, ask you, the, three of the uh, questions have come in, and they're on the EU taxonomy, which is um, currently uh, sort of recommended in a delegated act and supported by a technical expert group for to have a science based approach to defining what's green and what's not green. That requires uh, companies to start to evaluate their activities. And some companies in industry have been previously or are used to disclosure on greenhouse gases through the EU ETS uh, regulation. Others and the smaller ones and the ones that don't operate uh, big scale energy plants clearly haven't been used to providing that kind of information. Um, can you, as well as telling us how the Industrial Energy Efficiency Working Group will pre present its conclusions this year, can you also tell us whether you've had discussions about the EU taxonomy and, it, and, and how that might stimulate some best practices from your industrial um, user base? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's two big questions. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that I can really answer them. I think, I think what is very clear, I'll try to do it more general, um, is that uh, especially when we come to SMEs, smaller enterprises, which, which are, let's say, less in the focus and where we have, of course, by far less data and, and what can be done, um, we, we still see, of course, we know that there is, is very big potential. And I think uh, what we need to do here is it was said several times in this panel today, we need to give evidence that these investments in energy efficiency and to take this seriously. And uh, we do see a change already in, in, in some companies where they see the CO2 price increase. Uh, so for example, in Germany, having to pay a CO2 tax if you invest in something green, uh, which reduces your energy consumption, like when we fuel the car, a big part of the energy price in the future will be the CO2 tax. And that, of course, gives momentum also for those companies uh, to, to think a little bit different. But we are at the very start. And what I think would be great if we manage is to provide a kind of toolbox with some case studies, examples, where we can show in a brewery, this has been done, that was the result. And uh, like this, we have achieved a, a, a much better energy efficiency and even reduced production cost maybe in the, in the life cycle analysis. That's maybe another aspect to be introduced, looking at life cycle analysis rather than simple payback periods um, is also something I think where we can push for. Yeah, and uh, while I've got you speaking, perhaps the, uh, George uh, Rulius has asked a question in the chat, which is about ESCOs. So clearly ESCOs have been mainly directed at the industrial sector so far. He says that they're doing very well in the US and China. Um, he says that the EU is behind um, in the ESCO markets. So first of all, do you think that's true? And second of all, can you see uh, any plans to accelerate ESCO finance? 
without being an expert on ESCOs myself, but let's say looking back on the discussion we had last Friday, for sure we see that in Italy, there are quite some ESCOs operating successfully, but that is also due to the, to the special legislation uh, situation in, in Italy. For the rest of Europe, I think he's right. Uh, we are really lacking behind and uh, we don't see really ESCOs, you know, popping up and, and, and running successful projects in, 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 in European industry. And this is a shame, yeah, it's a pity, not a shame, but maybe a pity and a big business chance. We've been talking, Diti also said it, in the recovery, there is uh, room uh, for growth. Of course, we know that. Uh, we know that investments and the jobs for energy efficiency will be linked very much to Europe. Um, so everything is done here in Europe. And it's definitely an opportunity we should look into much, much more than we did in the past. Thanks, Andreas. And, and thank you to all the panelists. And in fact, as um, I think it was Elizabeth who said um, at the start, thank you so much to all of the members of the working groups who have um, tirelessly and uh, you know, on a voluntary basis committed their time to be able to support the conclusions which will be emerging later this year. So I'd like to, um, well, I'd like to have a round of applause really for our panelists, for our keynote speakers. We move into a coffee break now at 10.40 and we will pick up the, uh, the, the second section of our day, the two following panels. Um, at uh, just before 11 o'clock. So what I propose, um, it's, a, it's a strange thing, but uh, if everybody can uh, turn their cameras off, who's uh, a panelist uh, during the break, and if we can turn them back on again at uh, perhaps 5 to 11, and then for those participants, uh, we will start back the conversation at 11 o'clock. So um, until then, um, thank you very much, and we'll speak at 11.
Welcome back. I know it's a minute before we said we would start, but um, in the interest of time, what I'd like to do is just remind people that there are three ways of asking questions to our panels. We have two panels uh, for the rest of today. Um, your questions will be monitored either through the chat. So those of you on the Zoom will be able to type into the chat. Please don't use the chat for promotions or for things which are not relevant to the panel. Um, uh, secondly, you can use Slido, S-L-I dot D-O with the uh, key hashtag ethig. Um, those questions are being monitored by Dusan, who is curating them and sending them to the chat so that the panelists can see them. And he is also monitoring Twitter. So on Twitter, there is the hashtag ethig, which you should use both to retweet things that you see of interest, uh, to make comments, and also to uh, ask questions. So with that, um, and just as we come to um, 11 o'clock, um, I'd like to invite our panelists for panel one to turn on their cameras, um, and I see you are all here. Um, so uh, this uh, panel is for members of financial institutions uh, to discuss the opportunities for EFIG to contribute to the immediate uh, European policy objectives on climate uh, and in the context of recovery. So uh, welcome very much, and thank you for joining us to Stefania from the EBRD to Bettina from KFW, and from Bruce, uh, who is joining us from New York at 5 a.m. So thank you very much, Bruce, for not only uh, joining us, but also making the effort to get up uh, probably earlier than you normally do. Uh, we very much appreciate your uh, perspectives. So what I'm gonna do uh, for this panel is invite each panelist to provide a quick introduction to their, um, their organization and its role within EFIC, um, and particularly thinking about the, the moment we are in of increasing climate ambition. So perhaps we'll just go in the order that, uh, that is listed. And so I'll give the floor first to Stefania from the EBRD. Good morning, uh, Peter. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at the EFIC uh, plenary event. Um, my name is Stefania Rocolta. I am part of EBRD's Energy Efficiency and Climate Change Department, and I am in charge uh, of the relationships with the European Commission and bilateral donors on green finance, and also in charge of the climate analytics work that we do. Um, at EBRD, uh, the bank has recently launched the new uh, Green Economy Transition Strategy, uh, through which we basically uh, commit to become a majority green bank by 2025. This means that we are aiming for more than 50% of our annual business volume to go in the direction of supporting low carbon uh, technologies in the corporate sector, uh, low carbon infrastructure. We're gonna work hard with our partners in financial institutions across the EBRD region. Of course, we also have a target um, um, to reduce uh, carbon emissions and uh, we are uh, committing to uh, uh, gradual progressive alignment with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Um, EBRD is uh, one of the uh, original members of the EFIG initiatives and working very closely with uh, DG Energy and UNEPFI. So we are active since 2013 and very happy with the results of this uh, platform. We are hoping to bring with us more members to join soon. Thank you so much, Stefania, um, and thank you to the EBRD for its constant support of our initiative. Um, so we then uh, turn the floor to Bettina from KFW. Bettina. Bettina, you'll need to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm unmuted now. So good morning to all of you. Chilly Berlin, we have like uh, minus 10 degrees outside. And uh, my name is Bettina Dorendorf. I work in responsible for sustainability and uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable finance related uh, issues, emotional business. Um, <clears throat> and it's a pleasure for me to contribute part of the team at DG Enner when EFIC was set up uh, as a group of experts during my secondment to the European Commission. I'm, uh, I can want to say that I'm deeply impressed by the evolution of the work of the EFIC and how highly regarded it became over the last years. And I'm also delighted uh, that all this has led to the integration of the EFIC website to the inner domain. 
uh, I will skip the introduction to KFW because I think you are all uh, familiar with KFW as a large uh, um, a German uh, national promotional bank, uh, 70 years of experience in operation, 100% uh, public shareholder background, and uh, uh, it's more than 6,500 employees, uh, 80 representative offices worldwide and a triple A guarantee due to a state, a triple A rating due to a state guarantee. Okay, so um, KFW is um, uh, one of uh, the, uh, the EFIC. Um, um, our business volume normally ranges from between 75 and 80 billion euros. However, in 2020, one million financing applications and an impressive 75% increase in promotional volume to 136 billion euros. The main driver for this was uh, uh, the financial support provided by KFW on behalf of the federal government to fight against the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemia with a total volume of 50.8 billion euros. Carving out the COVID support, a share of 50% of financing was dedicated to environmental and climate purposes. Financing for energy efficiency and promotion amounted approximately 30 billion euros. This includes the well-known flagship program, Energy Efficient Construction and Refurbishment with 20... Let me say one word about speed. Uh, the COVID support programs were set up in less than one month. Um, and uh, uh, they did not have an explicit link to um, the agreed environmental purposes. Uh, more important was the rapid deployment of the funds to keep the uh, economy going. So let me uh, conclude by uh, mentioning that um, <clears throat> sustainability is a part of KFW's D and has set up uh, the Climate Protection Program 2030 in, for Germany. In this text, KFW will be developed further to a transformative promoter bank to support the transformation of economic sectors and the financial markets towards a climate neutral future. In this context, KFW is working to steer the portfolio of promotional activity towards climate Paris compliance by developing sector specific guidelines. Um, energy efficiency obviously is also part of our standard promotional uh, activities on behalf of uh, the federal government and so thank you very much. Thank you Bettina and uh, thank you again for being with EFIC since the very start when you were with the commission at that stage uh, on secondment and I'm very impressed to hear that KFW is doing a million loans a year in this space so look forward to your comments further on our panel. So Bruce turning to you in the United States please uh, welcome and introduce your organization and yourself. <clears throat> Hi, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, Stefania, uh, Peter uh, and uh, everyone thanks for the invitation. Um, great to be uh, with you all today. Uh, I'm with City uh, out of New York uh, with our asset finance group where I finance efficiency as a service for our institutional clients. Uh, we're, we're one of many groups around City uh, focused on ESG and the ESG needs of our clients. Uh, for efficiency, our focus is really on executing large programs of portfolios of properties and improvement measures. We utilize a, a services approach, given a number of attractive benefits that a services approach can offer, uh, especially that it's no upfront capex, it's off balance sheet, and it's a pay for performance structure for uh, the host, for the end user. Um, I think I'll just also mention that increasingly we're seeing uh, interest and in requests for scope three emissions, particularly in the area of supply chains or franchisees, uh, portfolio companies, portfolio properties. There's a understandable push into scope three. So that's an area that we are seeing increasing interest in. Lastly, I'll just uh, mention uh, like others here on the panel, um, greatly appreciative of the work of EFIG 
uh, Peter, I think we've known each other and worked together now maybe for a decade. And the sharing of experiences uh, has been really helpful for us. So thank you. No, no, thanks to all of you. Um, we look forward to a healthy collaboration um, under the new administration in the US and uh, pot potentially uh, moving into COP26, um, we can be uh, promoting energy efficiency investments and finance uh, together. So um, what we're gonna do now uh, for this panel is we're gonna put up uh, three questions <clears throat> that, that have been prepared um, based on uh, their relevance to, to financial institutions in this topic. So, um, Raphael, if you could put the first question uh, to the panel up on the screen so that we can see it. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to do is just read it and invite you in the order of which you have already spoken to perhaps address this. So, uh, Stefania, um, ESG uh, is increasingly among the top priorities for um, financial institutions, chief executives and their boards. Um, has this upgrade of those ESG priorities impacted energy efficiency investments? Thank you for the very interesting uh, question, Peter. Um, I think it's, it's a very good thing that uh, ESG are high on the agenda for um, FI CEOs and, and the board. In fact, we actually need more and more champions in the boards of financial institutions to make sure that uh, climate change considerations become a source of uh, competitive advantage rather than a source of risk. Um, when I think about uh, breaking down the ESG into environmental, social and governance, I would say that the environment and social policies of financial institutions and their robustness are driving up the, the quality of the investments. They are uh, very important from the point of view of compliance and safeguards, and it ensures that these institutions develop very high standard portfolios. Obviously, this is important for their access to capital markets uh, because institutional investors, credit rating agencies are increasingly scrutinizing these uh, policies uh, for issuers. Uh, but is this driving the volume of investment in energy efficiency? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, governance, on the other hand, and what we're seeing recently, especially the work on incorporating uh, climate corporate governance aspects uh, in our work with financial institutions, uh, basically working with the banks, working with the leasing companies to, to think about their strategies, their targets, their reporting and disclosures, but most importantly, how they introduce climate risk consideration in their risk management strategies. So here we see that when you start thinking about risks, this drives the um, allocation of capital in the direction of, of low carbon and, and green investments. So this gives um, a, new direct, uh, a new direction of travel, if you want, for financial sector. But is this enough to drive uh, a high volume of financing for energy efficiency investments? My experience tells me that perhaps not, not enough. Um, and in our work with, uh, with the local uh, financial institutions, in our dialogue with them, we discover more and more that what they need is um, support to originate high quality uh, investment opportunities. So what we are doing at EBRD is to try and bring in um, alongside our financing, uh, a package of technical assistance for uh, financial institutions and their clients. And we try to work to stimulate demand for such investments by doing marketing campaigns, awareness raising, creating real buzz in the market, um, talking to clients, companies, and residential sector about the um, added value and the multiple benefits of investing in energy efficiency. We work with suppliers to create catalogs of energy efficient technologies materials and equipment. We work with banks to help them create capacity with their loan officers. What we are trying to do is to help them to, to train loan officers, which are typically generalist bankers, to transform them into a real um, sales force to promote um, energy efficiency with potential clients. And finally, um, we are trying to structure programs uh, which are lightweight, which are relatively clear, simple, easy to implement. And sometimes we complement them with small incentives. And I mean, really small, just enough to 
create an appetite for this kind of investment just enough to stimulate the market. Sometimes it, they are structured as uh, small um, performance incentives attached to a loan. Uh, more recently, we see that there is an appetite for um, discounts on the interest rates uh, attached to the loan. So I would like to stop here and to emphasize how important technical assistance and capacity building is to create more lending opportunities for energy efficiency. Thank you. I appreciate EBRD works with a lot of partner banks and uh, you've got a lot to add. Uh, Bettina, would you like to address this question? You need to unmute. Bettina. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, I am. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, by looking at this question, uh, I um, thought, OK, uh, we know from a recent IEA energy efficiency report, if energy efficiency report that the investment volume into energy efficiency has not moved upwards during the last years. And therefore, my short answer will be no. However, there are several aspects I would like to point out in this context. First of all, I think it's very positive that the broader subject of sustainability and ESG issues have moved to the center of attention in politics and society and uh, the EU Action Plan on Sustainable Finance and the European Commission, and in particular also the EU taxonomy regulation are, uh, I think, strong drivers in this context. However, in the case of efficiency from many discussions we know that we are not talking about primarily about the lack of funding but more about the lack of projects and now i would like to connect to what uh, stefania just uh, mentioned uh, the a uh, in its report uh, recommended to set up an institution called sustainable infrastructure europe um, because uh, in order to uh, deploy um, technical assistance and advisory services by saying that this is it turned out, turns out to be the main bottleneck uh, for development of energy efficiency projects. So, and all this is efficiency investments uh, has been already mentioned. They are on average relatively small, highly fragmented, heterogeneous and cross-sectoral and difficult to standardize and to bundle for financing. So in order to um, build up a project pipeline, it's important to understand the need of the different group of actors involved. And even when looking at the building sector, this differs significantly between private residential, commercial property owners and public building owners. This is one of the main outcomes of us ethic board and uh, this is still very valid in my uh, opinion. Um, and it is equally understand uh, important to understand what financial institutions need to develop financial products. So I think it's important to distinguish here between private sector financial institutions. Public promotional banks such as KFW have a clear mandate to provide suitable investment products to foster energy efficiency um, investments and we uh, receive a budget to, to do this. However, as regards private financial institutions, I think slowly but surely the barriers to finance uh, energy efficiency investments are being addressed, but slowly. One of the main challenges um, named some years ago was the lack of performance track record and the collection of data is ongoing, as to mention the deep data base. It still needs more contributions. However, I'm confident that the quality and availability of data will improve over time, also triggered by the need to report in line with the taxonomy criteria. Another challenge identified was the lack of standards as efficient projects and the way they were presented for financing. Let me just name two examples. Uh, the approaches such, such as in a Giesbrong to prefabricate and standardize components for building refurbishment is an encouraging example for standardization. I also like to mention a small uh, German project which is called ACE, energy, Asset Class Energy Efficiency. And this aims to supply fit for finance pro uh, project information, making it easy for a finance provider to offer loans and bundle them into a portfolio. This is a plug approach involving a number of parties, and we need much more plug well um, functioning platform approaches. Uh, and stop shop solution where there are only a few out there really performing well. So um, observing this development over the, over the past years, my impression is that patience and persistency is required to create a fit for purpose framework conditions for energy efficiency investments. And um, let me uh, say one last sentence. 
I think energy efficiency deserves a more visible and prominent place in the overall sustainability debate. Thank you. Thanks, Bettina. And of course, we've heard mention of the private sector multiple times. Bruce, you're standing alone on this panel as the representative from the private sector. Tell us about how ESG priorities are moving energy efficiency at City. Sure. So, um, you know, we, we see on the institutional side, and, and I appreciate Bettina's comments around the fragmentation of the market by property type, by improvement measure. Um, on the institutional side, there are three things that we see. Uh, one is that as ESG goals grow and become more aggressive for many institutional clients, what that means is that the types of investments that they need to do are outpacing uh, what they're typically prepared to self-finance. So there's clearly a growing need for longer term financing to meet institutional goals. I think the second thing that we're seeing, which is really interesting is kind of more creative applications of what's typically been applied to buildings, but now seeing kind of that thought process extend into kind of all areas of the economy. So just one quick example, uh, we, we had a conversation with a European industrial company that, um, that makes uh, mining equipment and is moving into electric mining equipment. And their thought on energy savings is all around the avoided ventilation required. Uh, when you're mining with electric gear, you don't have the diesel fumes underground. So we're seeing like over and over again, all these really great kind of iterations of how do you capture efficiency in the transition to a cleaner economy. And then lastly, I would just say that I think what's interesting in this space again, as, as ESG becomes you know, a higher priority across the board, is that there's this real continuum of kind of preparedness and sophistication, right? There's some companies who've been at this for a decade or maybe multiple decades with really mature programs and others who are you know, kind of newer to the table, if you will. And so across those three things, what I would say, Peter, is, is that there's a real need for financial innovation, financial solutions to meet clients, you know, where they are, both on their maturity, on the kind of creative ideas that they're coming up with, and on this need for longer uh, term financing. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I appreciate you're on the very front line of serving clients' needs there. Um, the second question I wanted the panel to, to consider is, whether they can, some of you have already identified examples. We heard that uh, Ditta in her opening remarks praised EFIG for bringing forward best practice examples. But here, I'd like you to focus on those that reflect the link between the recovery and the green transition. So, Stefania. Just a short introduction to say that at EBRD, we have mobilized very quickly to um, put together a rapid response, um, a solidarity package and provide emergency liquidity to, to our clients. During and immediately after the um, COVID pandemic um, crisis uh, last year, we also increased the uh, financing available to keep the green trade um, going. So our trade finance program, uh, trade facilitation program, we also put in place a vital infrastructure support uh, program. During this phase, the, the crisis response phase, we have not necessarily introduced elements that make it, let's say, mandatory for clients to, to introduce um, green components in, in their investment plans or to um, undertake commitments to, to go in this direction. But definitely, as we move more and more towards recovery, what we are trying to do is to um, nudge clients in the direction of green energy audits, in the direction of um, disclosures. And uh, recently we, we've seen a number of transactions where alongside uh, liquidity and working capital to, to help the companies stay afloat and to ensure the continued financial uh, stability, we are going to work with them to um, help them identify climate risks um, include climate considerations in their strategies. So basically we are going to work with them 
for in close partnership for a period of time to help um, improve their climate corporate governance. I have an interesting example. Uh, we provided um, hundreds of millions of um, euros uh, working capital facility for a utility company in, in, in Greece. And um, one of the things that we are going to do with these companies is in collaboration with other MDBs and the utility, we will be working together to develop a program which will uh, support uh, transition from coal um, and uh, to address also some of the uh, social implications. So this company has a very ambitious plan to, to phase out coal generation and move towards low carbon. But we know that this will have uh, um, implications on, on uh, jobs and uh, the economy in, in that region. So um, this is going to be an interesting project for us. Thanks, Stefania. Bettina, perhaps you can talk about recovery and green transition from KFW's perspective. <clears throat> so, um, a link between uh, recovery and green transition. Okay, let me mention two points. First, I like to mention uh, that the uh, dra Germany's draft recovery and resilience plan has a 30% share of uh, funds earmarked for energy efficiency, covering uh, clean mobility and also energy efficiency in buildings. What concerns me in this context are the complex and ambitious requirements to be met for investments to for funding under the scheme. But in particular, I to the link established between the, uh, to establish to the do no significant harm criteria of uh, the EU taxonomy. Um, so, so far, uh, it is not really clear what kind of information has to be delivered here. And, uh, um, but we know that uh, uh, um, information regarding do no significant harm principle within the meaning of the taxonomy regulation is the basis for reporting on a single investment basis. So uh, in addition to a quite complex uh, climate tracking methodology. So in summary here, uh, I'd like to say that it concerns me a bit that in particular the, to the DNSH criteria hinder deployment of funds. And I think it's important to find a good balance between climate related requirements and uh, the necessary speed of deployment. So first, second, um, as a good example for a sector which um, um, has um, uh, pushes recovery and uh, at the same time um, provides a, um, a green, um, has a green character is the building. So um, investments into energy efficiency have been to, uh, in the building sector to be a very good local job motor. KFW is tracking the promotional effects of the loans and grants program supported with public funds. And in 2020, uh, the promotional loans and grants for energy efficient construction and refurbishment uh, triggered almost uh, a 78 billion of investment volume with uh, um, um, uh, a volume of the grants deployed by 26.7 billion. Um, so the job effects uh, estimated as to date are 820,000 just for 2020 for one year at least or duly created. So I think this is an proof that uh, uh, investing into energy efficiency in the building sector um, uh, is, is uh, a link between a, a green recovery and uh, an economic recovery. So last but not least, uh, these investments also have a significant CO2 emission reduction effect, um, which we track for the uh, promotional program, energy efficient construction and refurbishment. Last year, it was 703,000 tons. Um, and the program sums up uh, to 11.2 million tons CO2 emission reduction per year, triggered by the program since 2006. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bettina, and I really appreciate the link between uh, energy efficiency activities and the jobs 
being delivered in the recovery. We only have a few minutes to go. So I'm going to uh, ask Bruce whether he will sort of answer two questions in one, really. So it's the it's the um, examples from the recovery as well as what has surprised you perhaps in the last year, Bruce. Sure. So uh, really briefly, um, two things. Uh, one is uh, the intersect on recovery and COVID and efficiency in terms of the types of improvements that are being made and potentially made together, right? So getting back into buildings requires uh, a degree of comfort uh, assurance that it's a safe environment. And so a lot of the efficiency improvements have the opportunity to also address air, air uh, exchange, uh, light lighting uh, technologies that could help address um, concerns around uh, health, public health in buildings. So that's one, I think, interesting area. The second is just like the order of magnitude that's gonna be required. And I'm thinking locally here in New York City and the local laws passed a couple of years ago, 96 and 97, um, it is estimated that 20% of New York City buildings will not comply by the 2024 time period and 80% by 2030. And interestingly, uh, in that first or both categories are a lot of new buildings. So um, we're going to have to think, I think, creatively around types of solutions, envelope, um, kind of moving beyond the traditional uh, things that we focus on. Thanks. Yeah, I've re been reading about these innovative solutions that can be retroactively applied to glass buildings, tall skyscrapers and things, which is an area I you know, hope we'll be able to deliver to New York particularly. So just closing, um, Bettina, if you, uh, so first of all, KFW got a question that relates to what can you do specifically, given you do so much, and it's just, it's not just taxonomy, but it's, um, it's many things, including your standards, perhaps, that need to be addressed at KFW, according to um, one of our questioners. But can you uh, sort of think about that and also say what surprised you uh, in the recent past? <clears throat> yes, uh, what surprised me was, uh, despite the lockdown, we saw a significant increase in demand for energy efficient construction um, uh, loan program at KFW. So it actually doubled uh, to 93,000 loan applications uh, to a total volume of uh, 21 billion euros. Uh, this is due to um, a significant increase in promotional incentives. So the promotion incentives for efficient new construction was raised by 15%. So resulting in a, uh, in a grant component of 25% for energy efficient construction, this means 30,000 euros per loan of uh, 120,000 euros is a kind of gift from the German government. And if we look at energy efficient uh, refurbishment, also there was a significant rise. Um, uh, the repayment grant uh, is even higher, uh, up to 40 cents, so up to 48,000 euros uh, grant component. Um, um, so uh, an amount which the borrower does not have to pay back. So it's a gift, uh, it's a grant provided by the federal government, which um, um, uh, led to a record uh, number of um, applications. So uh, it clearly shows that uh, uh, the more financial uh, support uh, provided by um, public sources, uh, the higher uh, the incentive it is for um, um, uh, residential owners and also commercial owners to, to invest into their properties. Thanks, Bettina. And uh, we're slightly overrunning, but Stefani, I want to make sure that you get the last word um, to tell us what surprised you um, and the EBRD in the last year. Thanks. What surprised me really pleasantly um, in the last year or so is the fact that um, I think there's now an acute sense of urgency and everybody agrees that we can no longer work in small increments and we need to have um, a different approach. So we are all moving away from mainstreaming climate action towards systemic action where we want to intervene more upstream and we want to change uh, things uh, from within and take bold action. I also think I've noticed that the narrative has changed. Um, and when we talk to commercial banks, it's not only about climate risks, but the discussion goes more and more in the direction of uh, commercial opportunities for these banks. 
because they realize that they can tap into an enormous investment potential. And in order to address the enormous uh, investment needs, and I think by 2030, I, I've seen figures in the range of 25 trillion US dollars that need to go in the low carbon economies, banks need to be prepared and they need to um, move from about 10% um, of, of loans in their portfolio allocated for green towards something in the range of 30%. And last, I want to say that we also noticed that the next generation of financial instruments are, are changing. So last year, for example, the BRD has re, uh, invested a record amount in, in green bond insurances by clients in our region. We had the first uh, green bond issued by a corporate in local currency in Poland. We worked with the uh, National Bank of Greece for the first green bond issuance there. And uh, we also noticed that uh, the, the instrument design is, uh, is adapting. So the, corp um, the concessional blended finance elements, which are typically attached to, to commercial funding, are now used to instigate two shifts. One is to in encourage or reward clients for um, environmental uh, performance of their investments. And the second one is to encourage clients to take a behavioral change um, and to change their business model. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's five minutes over. I appreciate uh, all of the panelists uh, here joining us from financial institutions. Thank you very much to all of you, particularly Bruce, who was very generous to join us uh, early on in New York time. Um, we are now going to move to our second panel. So I would ask the panelists who have just spoken to switch off their cameras. Um, and, and I would ask uh, my uh, second panel, which is EFIG steering committee members, to turn, on their pan to turn on their cameras and join us now, please. Um, the EFIG steering committee is the governance body that helps advise the co-conveners. So that's DG Enna and uh, the United Nations Environment Programs Finance Initiative. Um, uh, and this, this steering committee meets quarterly, and it is currently going to meet on the 25th of February for the next meeting, and it will take into consideration the full results and summary of this plenary, as well as the inputs from the working groups and from its members. So it's uh, with great pleasure that I uh, welcome uh, to join us again in this plenary, Murray from D DWS Group, uh, Sandra from ING Bank, Jennifer from the European Mortgage Federation, and Martin from uh, DG ECFIN. They're all EFIG steering committee board members um, and uh, uh, each one of them will now uh, in turn introduce themselves and their role within EFIG, beginning in this order with Murray. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I work with, my name is Murray Burt. I work with DWS Scope. We are a major asset manager. Uh, we invest on behalf of institutional and retail clients across Europe um, and internationally. We are based in Germany. We are majority owned by Deutsche Bank, but we are listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of our clients, we manage uh, nearly 800 billion euros of, of investments across uh, all major asset classes. And our client base is also very, very international, but of course, centered in, in Germany. Uh, just next, please. Uh, our, our assets and our focus on energy efficiency reflect uh, our, our, the multi-asset class uh, efforts in, in, this, in this area. Uh, for instance, uh, gone green bonds is an important area for energy efficiency. Asset-backed asset um, uh, bonds have a great potential for particularly linking with the work of, of, of mortgage banks uh, that are looking at energy efficiency on green covered bonds and, and asset-backed bonds. Next on, on public equities, uh, the shares of companies that are providing innovative technologies and services have, are, are often found in ESG and, uh, and, and climate related funds. As well, investors are increasingly using our, our influence with companies to set uh, em emission reduction uh, targets. Uh, next, on real estate, there's there's now um, nearly four, five trillion euros of, of asset of dollars of assets under management from real estate funds and companies that are having their portfolios assessed every year based on on different sustainability assessments, and that's showing that energy efficiency is of growing importance to real estate investors. A number of uh, real estate investors, including DWS, have, have set net zero targets about twenty four. 
25 uh, real estate asset managers have set, set net zero targets for direct uh, properties that we're, we're owning. Uh, and as well, I've worked with the uh, UK's Brunel Pension Fund through the in Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change to create net zero guidance for what, uh, what real estate, uh, how net real estate investors can, can contribute to, to net zero. Private equity investments is, are also important for, for energy efficiency, helping innovative technology companies grow or distribute their products. Next, uh, and project level funds. We're honored to be the investment manager for the European Energy Efficiency Fund on behalf of the European Commission and the, Euro the European Investment Bank, where we have invested nearly 200 million euros across different public sector projects to reduce energy use across and in different buildings. Next. Um, and as well, the, 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 what's interesting is, is that mainstream infrastructure investors are also now starting to get into the energy efficiency area. Our Pan-European Infrastructure Fund uh, recently made an investment uh, into a company that will be acquiring uh, in, uh, energy efficiency related companies, providing services to really help scale up the market and, and address, the, uh, uh, address the fragmentation that exists in the market. Next. I briefly just say a few words about why energy efficiency matters to financial institutions. Uh, we've heard about the economic stimulus um, and from from the from the European Commission and the EIB, and this is a, has great potential for for stimulating economic growth and cutting carbon emissions. Every one million euros invested in building renovation creates an average of eighteen jobs. There's very strong academic evidence about the link between financial performance and green real estate. And as well, renovating buildings can improve air quality, which is which is a very important for our productivity and health, as we've heard from the multiple benefits working group. And as well, finally, our our, our clients, our pension funds and, and insurance companies are, are very challenged by the low interest rate environment. And so making more uh, investments into renovating buildings through the bond market uh, can really help our, our clients address their challenges and meet their, their obligations. Uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we've had done a lot on energy efficiency, but we have to face up to the fact that the investment levels are falling. So I think that's what we'll get into uh, in, in the discussion here today. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Murray. And now we uh, pass the floor to Sandra from ING. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks uh, for inviting me here. Can you go to the slides, please? So, and next one, please. Uh, yes, great, thanks. So, um, uh, as ING, uh, we're of course um, uh, heavily in, uh, interested in the topic of sustainability uh, as it fits our purpose. Our purpose is to empower people to stay a step ahead in life and in business. And that purpose also trickles down into the two themes of our sustainability direction, climate action and financial health. I'm not touch upon financial health today. Climate action is very much related to the work of uh, EFIC and hence also uh, this is why we're so much uh, interested and keen on being part of the of the steering committee. Um, and within climate action, we uh, aim to um, align our lending portfolio to the uh, goals of the Paris Agreement. And uh, within our lending portfolio, half is mortgages. Uh, so in terms of outstanding. So that's a huge part of our lending portfolio. And in um, houses, buildings, of course, energy efficiency is an extreme important driver to get to these Paris Agreement goals. Can you go to the next one, please? So how did we do that? And I now kind of realize it's very little, but then would like to um, uh, uh, ask you to go to the Terra Procus report, which we published in October last year. And you can see all of these graphs uh, full flash and um, uh, because it's a bit too little on this on the screen. But what we've done over the last two years, uh, so two years in a row for the built environment, both for residential and commercial real estate, we looked at our portfolio and the CO2 intensity of the entire portfolio, both for Germany and the Netherlands for residential. Um, and how it relates to the trajectory that we need to be on if we want to achieve the Paris Agreement goals. As you can see, we're slightly above, uh, hence triggering uh, orange dot, but well uh, on track, uh, I would say, to meet uh, those targets. And what we've also done last year is set an intermediate target for 2030. And that intermediate target is very much based on governmental plans. So what do we see governments wanting to 
contribute to this topic? How do we see them implementing policies that we can actually align with those policies and help our client, clients to uh, become more energy efficient in their houses? Last year, in the mortgages portfolio, portfolio we saw a, gr a growth of 4% in A-label houses which I think really clearly indicates that this is a growing market. And uh, we hope, of course, that that is a, a trend moving forward. Um, for the commercial real estate, uh, there's been policies already uh, in place uh, in the Netherlands on energy efficiency and commercial real estate. And that's also why you see a steeper decline there and also uh, a lot more ambitious targets uh, because actually there we think we can achieve the uh, Paris Agreement goals, not in 2050, but in 2040. And that's all because of policy, uh, policy being in place. Next slide, please. So that's, I think, what, what we're trying to do when it comes to alignment and also where uh, I think the opportunities that Murray was discussing as well, how we feel we can uh, uh, seize those opportunities. But I'd like to point out also the important part here is that energy efficiency is also about managing risks and especially transition risks, which I will come to in a minute, but also to make sure that those um, uh, physical risks that come with climate change are a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, keep them a little bit more in hand, so to say, because we've done a few assessments and you can see those in these pictures. And again, you can find larger pictures in our climate risk report, which we published in October last year as well, where we do feel there's quite some risk in the built environment. And it goes for our houses as well for our real estate, resident, uh, commercial real estate. Um, so if we don't do anything about energy efficiency, those risks will only uh, become larger. Can you go to the next slide, uh, please? Because energy efficiency and what we uh, foresee is, of course, also about managing transition risk. And the transition risk would come if we would have extremely ambitious or fast policy developments when it comes to energy efficiency, which would be good, but it also can trigger a lot of these risks. And I think in the EFIC, we're also discussing how we can do this in a way that it's not going to uh, destabilize the entire uh, market. I think that's very important. But also, what kind of technologies do we see out there that is actually going to uh, scale up and speed up the transition, which we definitely need? And customer preferences. I also heard uh, in the last panel a lot of discussions on how customers actually prefer energy efficiency, and that it actually stepped up in times of COVID. That's, of course, also an important sign that could up, speed up transition risk in our portfolio if we don't. Uh, act on it. Last thing I'd like to, to mention here is that uh, from ING, we've been involved in the uh, working group loan risk and performance assessment. Maybe we get to talk about this a little bit later in the, in the discussion as well. And what we're very keen on discovering there is the correlation between energy efficiency and the probability of default or actual defaults and how that correlation is actually a causal relationship. And for me, it's extremely, extremely important to um, ask five times why, because we can see a correlation, but there's also a correlation between intelligence and height of a person, which is not causal, <clears throat> because we know it has to do with age. And for us, it's really important to understand the deeper why, why do we see that correlation being there, as long as we don't know that, it's very uh, dangerous to actually implement any other uh, policies uh, because you might actually um, uh, disadvantage the people that need uh, the most to be helped with the energy efficiency measures in their houses. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more, you can find us, of course, uh, online. And also these reports that I just shared, the Terra report and the climate risk report can also be found there. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra. And um, I'm glad. I'm glad, even though no one can see it, but we're all tall people in this panel. Um, 
So uh, perhaps without further ado, we'll move to Jennifer. Jennifer, please uh, tell us how the European Mortgage Federation is looking at, at eFig and these opportunities. With pleasure, Peter. And actually, I'm very short, so I'm a bit concerned about what that says about my intelligence. But hopefully during the course of this panel, I'll be able to prove otherwise. But um, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to speak, um, Peter, this morning. Um, my name is Jennifer Johnson. I'm Deputy Secretary General of the European Mortgage Federation. We're essentially the voice of the mortgage industry and also the covered bond industry um, in Europe and beyond. We've been a member of, of EFIG and the steering committee for a number of years. Um, I found meetings actually in our calendar going um, as far back as February 2015, which coincided incidentally with the launching of our energy efficient mortgages initiative. And this is why, of course, I'm speaking to you um, today. You can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so our Horizon 2020 funded energy efficient mortgage initiative is intended um, very much as a concrete response to the huge investment needed in the EU's building stock to meet the EU's energy savings targets, of course, as everybody knows, um, and more recently to as a response to the EU Green Deal and the renovation wave strategy. Um, the initiative was essentially born from the recognition that banks um, in the course of their everyday activities um, that is mortgage lending could play a game changing role in relation in relation to the financing of um, the improvement of the EU's building stock by basically bringing energy efficiency into the conversation with borrowers and then financing those improvements or those purchases. You can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so taking this fundamental role um, as for banks um, in the energy transition as our starting point, the Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative was originally intended to deliver an energy efficient mortgage um, product and accompanying framework, which focused on um, valuation guidance, um, energy um, performance measurement parameters. But of course, as the relevance and the game changing potential of the initiative has become clear, over the years, um, the, initi the initiative itself has gone from strength to strength, and we have developed into other very key areas. Um, you'll see these here on the slide through additional Horizon 2020 projects, which have been focused on essentially designing, testing and delivering a full um, and integrated energy efficient mortgage um, value chain with a focus on data, data analysis. And um, Karen mentioned earlier on our EDAP correlation analysis, which I, I'll touch on perhaps a little bit later on in this discussion, um, consumer research, institutional cooperation, and um, most recently, an energy efficient mortgage label. Um, and I will finish here, Peter, but just to say that um, all of our efforts really for the, the, for the current time are very much focused on, on our energy efficient mortgage label initiative. On Friday of this week, we'll be launching um, the label in the presence of Energy Commissioner Simpson and the Portuguese presidency of the, of the Council of the European Union. You'll see, I think that's a reflection of how important um, the energy efficient mortgage label um, is and is seen to be um, by, by the European Commission as well. The label is intended very much as a quality benchmark to build confidence and trust in the energy efficient mortgage market. Um, and also, and very importantly, and I think this is very relevant for the discussion that has already taken place today, it's about facilitating comprehensive data collection, disclosure on energy efficient mortgage, on energy efficient mortgages for tagging loans in the loan book, for um, completing the, the lending and the, the funding value chain, for regulatory reporting. Um, and we believe that the energy efficient mortgage label has very strong potential to accelerate uh, market development um, in, in the very short term. So I'll finish here, Peter, but happy to pick up on all of these issues um, a little bit later. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I, uh, as a, one of the, your supporting organizations, I can certainly say that I think the work of um, uh, your group has been excellent throughout this period of EFIG. So thank you for your contributions. So um, uh, uh, just uh, finally, uh, I'd like to invite Martin uh, Koch from DG ECFIN to provide his opening remarks. Martin. Martin. Peter, everyone, can you hear me clearly? Good. Uh, well, I have a couple of minutes to uh, put FX work maybe in the uh, EU policy context, which I would like to do now. Um, let me uh, start with something very concrete. I mean, uh, our starting point was from a DG Ekfin's point of view, looking at uh, economics and finance, is the EFIC report of early 2015 uh, on how to drive new finance to energy, invest energy efficiency investments. I think it's a very good example of a report which is concrete and gives very, very uh, good insight in what is working, what is not working, 
in terms of frameworks and uh, financing instruments. And it was this starting point where we thought it's good to, to follow up on this. Also, I think EFIC has been uh, involved in a number of other projects which the European Union has supported. So there's a strong connection of EFIC to the EU policy and implementation. Now, looking at today's agenda, and I would like to just give you a bit of this overview is, I mean, we are looking at the European Green Deal, which is one of the priorities of the European Co uh, Commission and EU. It's about making Europe greener and more sustainable. And we heard this morning about the renovation wave uh, strategy, which has been launched in October last year. What is important to know is that energy efficiency is on the agenda, high on the agenda of the EU. And it's also of the, on the agenda because it's ultimately about investments and finance. And if I can just give you one uh, figure, which you may know, but I mean, if you look at the investment gap in the area of energy efficiency, only in the area of uh, residential and tax buildings, we have to invest every year 140 billion more than we do actually. This is a huge number. And if you look at the next 10 years, that adds up to a tremendous number. But this is about investment and finance. And also to, important to know is a good deal of this, those additional investments have to come from the private sector, meaning companies and private households. It is for this reason that we need to address the barriers to private investments and in energy efficiency and to look at practical finance solutions. Now, looking into what, what we are currently doing is we are about to launch the InvestEU program, which is uh, the new EU-wide program to uh, support investments through an EU guarantee. And it will offer a variety of uh, finance possibilities from equity to loans and all variations you can think of. Uh, in addition to finance, uh, InvestEU also has, has a dedicated advisory component to better prepare projects and to make them investor ready. Very, very important element. What we also will do is, uh, under InvestEU is we have a focus on sustainability and green investments. And we can support in, in particular energy efficiency investments under InvestEU. Very important to know. And we work with a number of institutions, uh, European Investment Bank, but also other partners. We have opened up this. So there are plenty of opportunities for a lot of banks and investors and, and funds. What we can also do under InvestEU is in the future is we can combine uh, loan and equity finance with grant components, what we call blending. A very important feature to, to reach out to, uh, to customers and also to, uh, to private households. What we will also do is, uh, in the uh, context of InvestEU, is to take into account our uh, supporting frameworks. And uh, the EU taxonomy was mentioned a couple of times this morning to also identify where are the, the greenest and the most uh, promising investments in terms of impact. Now, coming back to the policy uh, framework to uh, ethics concrete work, and I started with the ethic report of 2015 is, and the need to uh, really find practical solutions is, we are looking forward to ethics updated report, which you are preparing at the moment and which should be released, I understand, in autumn this year. If you can be, again, concrete and point to the real issues and uh, also maybe show some solutions, which would make a huge uh, positive impact on us. Then we can look at uh, best practices and how we maybe can, how we can scale them up at European level. And it's this kind of input from EFIC we are looking forward to. And uh, indeed, uh, it can make a, a big impact on us. And we are open to looking at uh, new uh, developments, new products and new, uh, let's say, financial instruments based on best practices. And here EFIC can make a big, uh, let's say, input to us, to our work. In that sense, uh, we're looking forward to this. I will leave it here and look forward to a discussion and the questions which may come later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, not just um, in your ECFIN role currently, but previously uh, when you were at FISMA um, supporting EFIG uh, for, for many years. So we now have three questions which um, have come through the EFIG members channels before we get to those that I've noted from the, from the uh, participants. And the first is, uh, what's the role of the steering committee of EFIG and how would you characterize the impact of EFIG since its first report in 2015? So perhaps starting in the order with Murray. Thank you, Peter. I think EFIG has had a tremendous uh, impact, uh, beneficial impact. I think it's paved the way for greater public-private cooperation on policy matters. I think it was sort of a bit of an exemplar and, and helped uh, pave the way for the Sustainable Finance Technical Expert Group. But we've really helped to elevate the importance of, of energy efficiency and, and our report um, in 2015 
came, came out and, and helped to put energy efficiency per, first as, as one of the key uh, commission uh, principles for, for energy policy. Uh, but since then, uh, our, our work at, and as a steering committee, we've really tried to help elevate, elevate and escalate ideas and, and, and concerns and su suggestions from the different working groups. So for instance, last summer, uh, the steering committee wrote uh, a letter to uh, Energy Commissioner Simpson with our ideas, uh, particularly in, in light of, of the COVID crisis uh, and, and making recommendations such as uh, helping, helping, making it easier for banks to uh, access energy performance certificates, uh, putting pressure on member states to publish renovation waves, uh, reforming energy performance certificates, and and many other other suggestions. Uh, I think we also, or our role as a steering committee is also to advise on on connections between different the different even EFIG working groups where there are relevant Horizon 2020 projects that have been supported for a number of years, um, as well as different external uh, uh, initiatives that the private sector is leading on. So for instance, I've, I've, uh, I've helped to facilitate some discussions between uh, the deep uh, energy efficiency database, uh, between Gresby, the real estate assessment for, for real estate investors, um, and CREM, the emission reduction curve uh, efforts for, for real estate investors to see how real estate investors can better track uh, the actual performance of, of energy efficiency. Uh, we also advise on provide technical advice um, and we can of course do more of that. I think there's, there's great potential on the issue of discount rates uh, that policymakers use in their impact assessments for, for EFIG to provide input there. And as well, we can uh, make suggestions for new EFIG working groups and, and one, two, two ideas that I think we have are looking at how we can internationalize EFIG and involve particularly financial institutions and policymakers in the US and, and elsewhere. And also look at uh, the missing sort of stool of, of EFIG is, is the energy market, uh, utilities, energy regulators. And I think we need to do more to, to engage there. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it that. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Murray. Uh, Sandra, same question. Yes, maybe um, uh, just to amplify what uh, Murray was already saying, I think the topic expertise and uh, the ability to drive change together is, is really important. I also like to um, uh, mention the, the, uh, the detecting what is the what are the hurdles, what are the challenges. Um, that's a really important role. Um, what I what I see is that we do that in a in a very um, cohesive way and look at what is what is hampering the European market, so to say. But when, also when it comes to more national challenges, we also have the ability to move to national hubs, which we've done with some of the working groups. And I think that is a really an important thing to also remember moving forward. That when it comes more and more a concrete action, um, national hubs will probably be more needed as there is difference in, 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 in markets. And um, so it's an important trend that I would foresee for, for the future, which the EFIC um, has been very well in detecting that that need is there. Um, so that would be my uh, addition to what Murray has already been saying. Thanks very much. Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I mean, I think Murray and, and Sandra have made excellent points, so I won't repeat those. What I would say from, from our perspective, um, and, and specifically the Energy Efficient Mortgage Initiative, is that um, eFig has been a very, very valuable amplifier of, of our own work. So, of course, energy efficient mortgages are, are an area that, that eFig um, considers and looks at. Um, but we, we have presented our results um, to, to the EFIC steering committee. Um, EFIC has taken, in many cases, this work forward in parallel to our own work. Um, so amplifying, if you like, and, and further extending our own research. And I'm thinking here specifically of the correlation analysis that Karen mentioned earlier on. Um, this is work that we started in, in 2016 um, under our first Horizon 2020 project. Um, EFIC has taken this forward. Um, and this, we think, is very valuable for, for, in terms of reinforcing, if you like, our initiative, our messages um, to policymakers, um, spreading this through the, the very vast network. Um, and what I wanted to say here, actually, because I think it's a great opportunity, is that obviously Karen pointed to, you know, what, what, what will the next steps be in terms of, you know, the prudential treatment, for example, of energy efficient mortgages. And actually, this is something that we're working on at this moment. We're in the process of elaborating recommendations on the back of the correlation analysis, um, which of which there is now a, a, a growing body of evidence. 
Um, so we would be really very, very interested in you know, presenting these recommendations to the EFIG steering committee, discussing them, um, seeing to what extent you know, we can put our heads together and, and, and also you know, amplify the work here. So it's, it's, from our perspective, it's a great amplifier of our own work, um, Peter, and we're grateful for the opportunity to, to, to be able to present through the, the forum. Thanks so much. Um, Martin, uh, on this question. Uh, very quickly, I don't want to extend this, but I mean, uh, I would like to add one maybe a view, uh, looking from the Commission's perspective, we look, of course, at policy implementation and the steering committee for me is the forum where we can also operationalize our policy, look what EFIC can do with it and then get a feedback from EFIC from the market because EFIC banks and, and members are close to the market, they know their clients, they know the products, they know the, the gaps and what to do in the future and it's this feedback loop we I see where the EFIC steering committee is central to it. We can learn from ethic practice and we can try to translate our policy into more practical applications. That's the role I see and I think it has been uh, doing quite well in the last five years. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Um, you and indeed Dita mentioned uh, the role of exemplar successful in innovative financing mechanisms um, that we can replicate. So I want to go straight to that question and say, Murray, what are they? I think uh, there's three ideas that I want to, to suggest briefly. So real estate investors, 26 real estate investors with more than 11,000 buildings have committed to net zero. All real estate investors need to be doing that. That could be accelerated if uh, the policies use the same metrics. So the CREM, CREM curves are being used by investors. It would be very powerful if EU policymakers across the taxonomy and energy performance certificates and building performance standards use that as well. Uh, the work of the Green Mortgage Federation, uh, European Mortgage Federation on, on green mortgages is, is very important and needs to be scaled up. Um, all banks should be offering energy efficient mortgages in, in some way, shape or form. And then I think the uh, we can also look internationally. I think there's a number of US utilities that are procuring energy efficiency uh, from ag aggregators, creating revenue or cash flow for project developers. This, this changes energy efficiency from just being cost saving to be actually a revenue opportunity. I think we need to be looking at how we can be replicating that, build on, building on the work of the Sensei uh, project and, and seeing how we can really link energy markets and energy efficiency uh, with, with, with the financial markets uh, to really drive, drive investment. Thanks. Thanks. Sandra, same question to you. Yes, so for the residential um, built environment, I would be keen to look at more public-private collaborations. Um, we've seen a few. Uh, I think the warm fonds in the Netherlands is a good example of that. Um, and why it is so important is that we can say we need green mortgages, probably we do, but if we, if we look at our existing mortgage portfolio, these people do not want another mortgage, um, especially with a lot of administrative hassle that comes with it. They probably just want to spend their own savings. Maybe they want to use a loan. And for that, it is important that there's other alternatives than just a green mortgage on the market. And to keep that as cheap as possible, I think these public-private collaborations are really imp uh, important because we also know that people actually do not want to loan money for these energy efficiency measurements. Um, so it needs to be as cheap as possible to also get a good return on, uh, on their uh, actions. Um, so that would be, that would be my, uh, my uh, point of view on this. And uh, I think uh, there's great potential to do that uh, but it takes quite some time to do that. And I'm not too sure if we have enough time because the appetite to actually start investing uh, with homeowners is getting larger, as we've also heard in the previous panel. So we need to step up uh, our efforts there. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, so Jennifer, um, do you want to answer this question? Sure. Um, I mean, Murray mentioned our energy efficient mortgages um, initiative. We've talked now several times about green mortgages. We, we continue to stand by, if you like, the what we consider to be the, the transformative role um, of energy efficient mortgages in relation to financing the improvement of the EU's building stock. Um, so this absolutely remains for us um, a priority. At the same time, um, we certainly recognize the point that um, Sandra is making that, of course, green mortgages are not necessarily the solution to, to every, every, um, every situation. So just to give you an example, through our energy efficient mortgages label, we're also offering the possibility for banks to actually label other types of products because we view this really as a kind of let's say an ecosystem of products and and services that should 
dovetail together to make sure that all consumers are served in the best way possible. Um, something else that we're looking at um, is a way of um, supporting SMEs through a kind of rating system in order to enable them to access energy efficiency financing for energy efficiency investments. So we're also trying to turn our attentions to, to SMEs. Um, you know, we're also looking always at improving um, disclosure around covered bonds. So we've added um, an ESG section to our covered bond label um, in, the, in our harmonized transparency template. So we're just trying, I think, always to to improve the to raise the bar improve disclosure improve the let's say the the, the value chain or the ecosystem um, and build um, robust um, robust value chains which are mutually supportive and and create the kind of a seamlessness if you like um, in in the offer to the market so those are just a couple of the uh, the issues that we're also looking at at the moment uh, for the time being um, and happy of course to discuss these together um, in the future Thanks so much, Jennifer. And um, Martin, perhaps to you. Uh, yes, quickly, uh, let me add and answer the uh, question straightforwardly. Are there uh, examples of innovative financing mechanisms from which we can learn? Yes, we can. We know a lot of examples uh, which have worked in uh, EU member states, for instance. They are mainly tailored to the needs of countries. On the other hand, there are some elements which are kind of common features. For instance, combining grants with loan finance having these packaged instruments or funds which have a layered structure where the public takes the first loss or the risk. It's about risk sharing and how to aggregate portfolios. I think we have learned a lot in the last years. We know where good practice examples exist. And we, what we would like to know now is how we can scale them up at European level. And that links me back to, uh, or brings me back to the, uh, the InvestEU program where there is this possibility to link up and scale up. I think we have learned a lot in the, uh, in the past, also through ethic work, and we know where the examples are, we know what to look at, look at, we know what has worked. Now it's time to scale up and replicate. Couldn't agree with you more again, Martin. Um, and, and our final question deals with uh, institutional cooperation. So we heard from the EIB earlier, which is sort of, as it were, the institution, which um, the public institution, which sits at the sort of nexus of that cooperation and the design and the implementation of many financial instruments that uh, support the EU's policy objectives. So turning to you, Murray, um, tell us um, how we can do better. How can we replicate faster as Martin is, is keen to see? Yes, exactly. I think we can do that by using the same metrics uh, across the financial institutions and policymakers. So I mentioned that briefly, but the, the carbon risk and real estate monitor pro project was in the Horizon 2020 project and also had support from uh, three of Europe's largest institutional investors, APG, PGGM and Norges. And it has created a series of uh, emission reduction or energy intensity reduction curves across uh, across different buildings and different countries uh, around the world. So it's really setting the framework for what is a science-based target for, for real estate and, and buildings. And if, if, if that's, because, that's been embraced by real estate investors and is being integrated into the annual Gresby real estate assessment, it's been integrated into the investor's definition of what net zero means. So I think investors, uh, as investors are, are really embraced this, I think policymakers can look at how that can be incorporated into the EU taxonomy, into the redefinition of and the reform of energy performance certificates, and critically into the creation of mil minimum bu building performance standards, uh, which is what one of the one of the recommendations or, or commitments of the renovation wave strategy. So if we have the metrics that are being used by, by financial institutions and policymakers pulling in the same direction, Direction, I think that will really help accelerate action. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Murray. To liven it up a bit, I'm also going to bring in the questions from the floor into this round, um, Sandra, if that's okay with you. Um, there's one directed at you, as it turns out. So please refer to in institutional cooperation in your answer, but also tell us a bit about um, your mentioning of the causal or correlative risks that there are in asset energy performance. Thanks. Yeah, very good question. Thanks for, for uh, asking that. So what I, in the end, it's not about the statistics. It's really about understanding what is driving uh, the probability of default. So if I am a homeowner and I am not able to pay my mortgage anymore or the risk, just the risk of not paying it. So being uh, uh, behind, for example, is that really caused by me having a poor energy efficiency in my house? 
or is it caused because I actually already was in financial problem? Maybe I lost my job. Maybe there were other social demographic characteristics that actually was causing this default and not the energy efficiency. So let's say it is, it has something to do about your financial position. What if we would implement something that would uh, um, have banks uh, looking at bigger risks when it when there's not an energy efficient label to a home? That would raise prices, would increase the interest rate for these type of houses, would actually penalize the people who don't need it. And with that, they will never make be able to make the changes to their houses. So for me, it's really about understanding and how can we make sure that you implement the right policies to make sure that you don't hurt the, right, the, the wrong people, I would almost say. And I think this is probably also something that is different in different countries. Uh, it's, it's absolutely not the same throughout all European countries. So we need to make sure that we really understand this on a national level, bring that back together and then decide on what's the best way forward. So that's the, the reason that I uh, put that point in. And that's also what we're doing in our um, working group on uh, on this topic. So that's the conversations that we're having there. No, thank you very much. It's, it's so important in this climate transition to have an inclusive transition and make sure that the energy poor and that uh, households which uh, maybe can't access mortgage um, uh, debt get supported by the recovery funds. Uh, because Absolutely. the biggest the biggest wave of public money is coming, and we heard earlier on our panel about how that uh, recovery fund money could be better used for energy efficiency activities. So turning to Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, there's the question here on the institutional cooperation, but also Margarita said, um, what data do we need to sort of? We've heard a lot about data, and I know you sit on 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 multiple organisations pro providing multiple data to you. Can you perhaps talk about cooperation and also address this question of what data is needed? It and where are we going to find it? Sure. So um, in terms of institutional cooperation, perhaps if I take that one first, um, again, if I use the example of our energy efficient mortgages initiative, um, as the African proverb goes, it takes a village to raise a child. And what we've, I think, realized over the last years is that it takes a complete ecosystem to deliver energy efficient mortgages. And this means not only identifying the right actors, but the, the, right, the services, the solutions, the products they deliver and the relationships between them so that we can develop this ecosystem, which in turn delivers this seamless energy efficient mortgage um, customer journey and value chain. So, um, and what we view as central to this is cooperation between and across um, institutions, but also more broadly cooperation between institutions or authorities and banks. Um, because in this way, we can ensure essentially that the public and the private sectors go hand in hand and that the efforts are concerted, that the action of one can leverage on the action of the other and vice versa, so that we really achieve these multiplier or scaling up effects and that we can go faster and further um, as soon as possible. Um, and we have an energy efficient mortgage um, um, advisory council where we have a number of um, local, regional, national, international organizations who sit there and advise us on the work that we're doing. You mentioned data. Data is, of course, absolutely fundamental. Um, data, it became apparent to us or, you know, very shortly after launching our initiative that data was absolutely fundamental to this because we felt that if we got the data aspect right, we would underpin the business case um, for energy efficient mortgages. We could, um, you know, understand this correlation that Sandra has been talking about between um, building energy performance and probability of default or loss given default. Um, this could at some point in the future translate into better capital requirements for these types of mortgages and you know, help to incentivize further the, the origination of energy efficient mortgages. Um, we did a lot of research under our one, one of our Horizon 2020 projects into what kind of data do we need and how best to collect this data, how to minimize the burden on banks, because of course banks already have huge data collection and disclosure requirements, reporting requirements. So how to let's say, integrate this in, a, in, a, in as robust, but nevertheless as, 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 um, as simple way as possible uh, into the day-to-day -day business so that this doesn't become a disruption, but rather a simple, you know, a part of the business case. So we, we, we um, designed what we refer to as a master template, um, which is essentially um, it's, it's loan data, it's, it's borrower data, it's property data. It's also then building energy performance data. And we try to link all of this together 
with a focus on the EPC, because of course the EPC, whether we think it's the most efficient tool or not, is the tool that is of course enshrined in the EPBD um, and we believe is the tool that will be taken forward. Um, so it's, it's about the, the, the year of construction of the building and the EPC, so the energy class of the building. Um, and then we, we, we seek to try to obviously make the necessarily necessary links um, in the in banks um, books to understand, of course, you know the correlations between these. Um, and it's this master template that feeds um, a harmonized disclosure template, which we will um, ask banks to um, complete when they become members of the energy efficient mortgage label. We currently have, I think, 14 labeled banks. I think now 15 labeled products, or even more. It's changing by day by day. Um, I mean, I, we we completely understand. We completely agree with the points that um, Sandra made. It's it's these these correlations are are challenging. Um, you know, we haven't yet, I think, in our research, managed to bottom out the, the causality. What we would say is perhaps we we would need to consider it also the other way around. That you know, a, a poor energy, a building with poor energy performance is not necessarily a cause of default. Although we do understand that in many countries, uh, there are a number of households who really are faced with very, very high housing costs, which do represent a large proportion of their budget and which can push them into, into financial difficulty. Um, but what we, would, what we would see the other way around is that in a, in a household where there is, um, let's say, some financial distress, the idea that you have um, lower energy bills means that there is this more disposable income available to service the mortgage. And what we do know from research is that it, the mortgage is the last payment that a, that a household will default on. So they'll stop paying their credit cards, they'll stop paying other bills. The last bill they will, they will stop paying, of course, is their mortgage because they, they realize it's, it's, it stands between them and the roof up above the, over their heads. So it, we, would, we would consider it perhaps in that way rather than the other way around. Um, but of course, the data collection, the data analysis continues um, and perhaps we're not, you know, we're, we're looking forward to your support as well in this respect. We're, we're very much looking forward to the report that you'll be publishing on, in October and yeah, the work continues. Thanks, Peter. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And actually that partially answers Julie's question from the chat. That's the role of social housing. Um, so clearly there, that is an opportunity for institutional collaboration and clearly social housing uh, landlords could be providers of data perhaps that would enable um, public investment and private investment to, to be blended for that seg segment. Uh, Martin, just turning to you, and I'm going to throw you a few questions as well as this uh, cooperation question that have come in through the chat. So uh, Tatiana asks, um, we've been doing some blending and, te and, te um, and technical assistance, um, which, you know, at European level, which you're aware of. Um, how do we do more of that, you know, at the member states level through the recovery and resilience uh, facility? And then additionally, previously, someone had mentioned about the details to the energy efficiency first principle. So uh, there's a few things I think directed to you. Please uh, choose from that in terms of which one you'd like to answer, Martin. And you might want to unmute yourself if you're talking. Martin, we can't hear you. Okay, we seem to be having technical trouble to hear Martin Koch, but um, uh, we are perhaps going to run this session for another uh, few more minutes. So in which case, uh, going back to the questions that I had had previously, um, Sandra, are you able to comment on Julie's question of the role of social housing? Because I think in the Netherlands, you may have projects which um, have been quite exemplar in that way. Mm. Yes, we have seen these projects and yeah, a, a little bit out of my, my expertise, I would say. But what we've seen here is a policy to the social housing associations that there's a need and a, an obligation for them to do uh, to apply energy efficiency and have a certain level of that in their portfolio, which of course then spurs the interest to to actually do so. But that's to to me, I don't I don't have the full details on that. So uh, sorry, I can't answer your question uh, there, Julie. 
That's okay. I, I appreciate everybody here is is now sort of we're an open season. If you can't answer a question, please feel free to say so. Um, another question which I which I note to our panel was um, we've talked a lot about one stop shops, and they could they can either be local authorities, escos, or banks, or some of them, or all of them mixed. Um, does anyone on the panel have a view as to who's the best one stop shop? I have a view on that. I think it's a mix. Okay. And the reason for that is that we've been trying some of that one-stop shop uh, innovation, and it's quite difficult to do that from one perspective or one expertise. So I definitely feel it needs to be a mix. Also, maybe to address another question that was asked, I think from Johannes, how do you get all of this to be actually executed? I mean, it's nice to have this huge amount that we need to invest, it's already hard to get uh, uh, people to, to actually want that, right? To do those uh, changes and in, in renovations to your houses. But then who are the people who are actually able to execute upon that? So in order to orchestrate all of that, I think you need that mix. Otherwise it's not going to fly. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I, I, could, would, I, I would completely agree, um, Peter, if you, if you allow me. With, yeah. with Sandra, I think absolutely you need a mix. Um, and this is why I was talking really about the ecosystem. You know, we need an integrated ecosystem when, where everybody has a role and those roles are clear, clearly defined. And, you know, in the past, we, for example, worked um, with uh, Saint-Gobain, um, uh, Knauf, because, you know, they themselves recognize the importance of, ups, you know, skilling up their, their workforce, making sure that they know what they're doing, um, they've done a lot of really uh, very interesting work. I know in, in Belgium, actually, with social housing projects where they, you know, to integrate um, all of the skills necessary to, to execute and deliver. And so I think it's really about that. It's about an ecosystem. Um, it's, it's the same with the one-stop shop idea. You know, it needs to be collaborative. You need everybody around the table. And I mean, there are some great examples in Ireland, I think, around one-stop shop. Um, our Spanish hub is looking at one-stop shop in in. In Italy, we know that um, uh, one of the largest um, uh, Italian banks is looking at a kind of one-stop shop idea, but you know, how can they also be advisor to the client on these kinds of issues alongside advising on financial aspects? So I think it's really about looking to the future and almost a kind of different business model for banks in a way, but also a very collaborative um, way of approaching these issues. Absolutely. I mean, we had a question and we should probably end uh, just soon enough. But the final question, um, somebody had mentioned in response to what Martin had said, that the additional 140 billion euros that's required annually to invest in energy efficiency is clearly going to create a lot of skilled jobs. And you mentioned that, Jennifer, and I know in a report you've talked about that. Do you want to tell us kind of how many jobs really that uh, energy efficiency upgrades can, can, can create? Oh, goodness, now you're really putting me on, putting me on the spot, Peter. I have, I, I'm afraid I don't have that number, but we are potentially creating, you know, this is really, you know, potentially a, a huge, um, you know, way, I don't want to say wave because that implies something, you know, kind of temporary, but this, this does have the potential to create a completely new industry. Um, and obviously you need the skilled labor at the end of the chain to be able to deliver on that. Um, so this is something we've we've actually re recently been discussing this because what we also do and uh, apologies for kind of name dropping but we we hold a monthly Bauhaus event where we just try to bring together you know great ideas around innovation sustainability any ideas which is a good idea and we recently discussed this you know how do you actually make sure that the, the labor force is kind of has the necessary skills I see another question here in the chat from from Kevin about you know involving energy suppliers. Absolutely. I mean, we've been working with Aon um, throughout our energy efficient mortgage initiative to bring them in because they're doing such great stuff around home energy management systems, um, you know, integrated product offerings. And this, again, I'm, I think for me, one of the themes here is really ecosystem. It's about, you know, nobody can do this on their own, whether you're a bank, a local authority or mm. whoever you are. We need to do this together. And so this is why eFig, um, our energy efficient mortgage initiative or whatever platform such as this is, is a great way of bringing all of the different parties together on an equal footing, um, you know, with one objective in mind, which is to finance this transition. So Fantastic. sorry, I can't give you a number. I've, no, I'm sure I, 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 I was thinking, no, I was thinking of BPIE published a study that said uh, every one million euros worth of uh, 
uh, investment in the buildings uh, upgrade and renovation energy efficiency space created 18 jobs and yeah. I, I that that to me was one of the sort of eye-catching figures um, I think we've got Martin Koch back and because just before we end I wanted to give him the opportunity to take the floor again because uh, both uh, he's he will come in advance of Carlos from DG Enna's uh, final closing remarks. But Martin, uh, I had asked a question of you, which which was relating to uh, technical assistance. Um, how do we get more of that out into the me the uh, member state level through the res the recovery and resilience uh, funds, as well as energy efficiency first? But uh, but also perhaps as the final word on this panel, if you have any further remarks, please uh, speak now. Sorry, I was cut up for two, two minutes and now I'm back. Uh, maybe on uh, technical assistance or what we call also advisory, which I mentioned in the InvestEU context, there are other programs like Eleanor, which have worked well. There's a wealth of technical support assistance out there. And I think it should be uh, used more actively. And I think it also we will uh, increase the budget for those uh, technical assistance facilities. So it's an, an important component in preparing projects. Maybe in terms of the last word, and I would like to say one thing about which I couldn't do uh, two minutes ago is on how can financial institutions better support policy objectives. It is key for us as policymakers to have your honest feedback. I mean, we ask you to implement our supporting frameworks. We ask you to report and disclose, to use the taxonomy in the future. You need to know us how that works. Does it work? Is there something missing? Are there elements which don't work that we can adjust? And with you together, develop the policy. You are basically part of this policy development process. You are not only the victim, you are also have an, you have an active role in this. And your honest feedback, and ethic is one of the four fora which we can use for this, is to get your feedback and make it better. I think it's it's a, it's a really a joint effort here. And I would like to stress this, that this is a dialogue of, of two sides and we have to advance together. That would be also my final word, but I mean, please take it as an invitation to give us an honest feedback about best practices, what you see as obstacles that we can tackle them together uh, as soon as we can. Thank you so much, you so much. Um, yeah. Martin. You may need to just mute because I can hear myself echoed in your... But um, thank you to all our panelists and thank you to all of your organizations for being a part of our steering committee. And thank you to the other members of the steering committee for also their contributions to EFIG as we go ahead. Thank you to all of you uh, as participants for all of your questions that we weren't able to answer. As I said previously, we're going to try and take notes of those. And if you'd like to um, send them via the EFIG uh, website as well uh, uh, and log into our um, and, and to our newsletter there, that would be a great way for you to continue this dialogue. So without further ado, um, and just to close our session today, I'd like to invite Carlos Sanchez, who is the uh, point person for EFIG within DG Enna, and who's really the day-to-day -day, uh, sort of hands-on uh, uh, manager of our, of our work. So Carlos, please, um, please take the floor and uh, close our session. Uh, thanks. thanks a lot, uh, uh, Peter. Well, so uh, so first of all, I, I would like to to thank uh, all all participants for for having joined uh, today for for the FIC plenary. I'm delighted for the very insightful presentations and discussions that we have had uh, uh, today on on, on this uh, first first day. So let me, in particular, I would like to highlight uh, our Director General for Energy, uh, Mrs. Dita Judo Pensen uh, Awards, and uh, and in particular on the how she highlighted the importance that energy efficiency has uh, in the climate transition, and also in particular in the framework of the EU recovery. And, and also the recognition to the very important work of EFIC that has been doing uh, since uh, the group was, was created. Also, Mr. Thomas Ostros, Vice President of the EIB, so how the EIB as the EU Climate Bank is focused in prioritizing energy efficiency, and also the need to use this uh, public money to, to leverage private financing. And, uh, and the Mr. Ostros uh, also makes some references to some existing uh, um, facilities or initiatives that are quite successful, such as PFOE and Elena in doing this, uh, this uh, work of leveraging private funding. Uh, we also had the opportunity to hear from international public and private institutions, financial institutions, uh, about what are their actions and what are their plans in the field of, of energy efficiency and the important role that it's play in their organizations for the, for, the, for the years to come. We also have the opportunity to discuss about the results that the various uh, EFIC working streams 
have achieved uh, uh, during the, the last year. And despite the circumstances that made the really a bit, uh, uh, I mean, meetings and all the work com uh, coordination a bit more complicated, I think that EFIC working groups in 2020 has really uh, overcame the, the obstacles and uh, has really made good progress and delivered valuable inputs and results uh, on the on the current state of energy efficiency financing and also on the future uh, development that has to be to be explored. And I would like to finally mention as well that we have had uh, today a very rich discussion on what are the, the, the policy priorities, some of the priorities more in general for, for the years to come uh, for, for EFIC and in particular how EFIC could continue playing this uh, key role that it is facilitating energy efficiency investments and, and financing. Uh, so uh, we have had today more than 450 participants registered. So I think that this, this is very happy that, uh, that we managed to widely uh, spread uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, EFIC uh, plenary among the, uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders. And we are able to reach uh, stakeholders from across the, the, the EU. Let me uh, particularly thank all the speakers because really I think it has been really excellent contribution and, and input for the discussion. Uh, from, from my side, uh, there is not much more to say. Let me also repeat that, uh, that uh, again on the importance and on the relevance of the role that EFIC could and will play in the next years in the framework of the climate uh, increased climate ambition for 2030 in the framework of the, the recovery. Mobilizing private investments is, is key and EFIC has proven to be a fantastic platform to contribute in this aspect. So I'm looking forward to seeing the, the EFIC members tomorrow uh, for the for the second part of the of the of the of the meeting of the of the EFIC uh, uh, plenary. Uh, so if and let me let, let me uh, uh, tell to all the different participants today that are not uh, EFIC members that you can apply uh, for the membership uh, uh, via the, the EFIC uh, uh, website. Proceedings of this event will be made available on the on the EFIC website in the in the in the next uh, uh, days. And let me also uh, tell you that, uh, that you can also register for our newsletter that will give you updates and progress and future events. So just to conclude, uh, I would like to, to thank the, the consortium uh, team that are in charge of organizing this, this plenary. And also would like to thank in particular Peter Sweetman, rapporteur of, of EFIC for his excellent moderation uh, today. And on behalf of the DG Energy team uh, that we are working on EFIC, and in particular, uh, Marine, uh, Dirk, and, and Adrian, that have worked hard to prepare and make uh, this plenary success, uh, many thanks for, for ha having followed this first day of the EFIC plenary 2021. Thanks, Carlos. I also wanted to echo your thanks to your team. Uh, you have many people working at DG Enna supporting us and also to the technical team that have supported this plenary. So behind the scenes, we've had uh, Dusan, Raphael, Rasmus, Carsten, um, and, a, and a full complement of technical and, uh, and content resources. Thank you to all of you for your hard work. Um, and thank everybody. EFIG has over 300 members currently. We're actively recruiting. We'd love as Carlos has said for you to join us. Um, we very much uh, look forward to tomorrow's um, sort of Chatham House rule um, uh, working session from all the working groups where we will be discussing the details of what's um, going on in the working groups. And we hope that you will all follow us um, through the DGNA website and read with, with interest all the reports that will be um, published there later this year. Thank you for your time uh, at this plenary and uh, we very much look forward to seeing you and contacting with you again.